This is A's Cast Live, your comprehensive look at the Oakland Athletics. Rooker, it's a fly ball to deep center. Robert going back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. And 29 other MLB clubs. Adolis Garcia sends on the other way. That sends Carroll back. He's at the line. Legend grows. Well, Acuna, another milestone in a truly historic season. Julio with an absolute nuke out to left field. It's Glaber Day. Like a good Glaber, Torres is there. Join us as we take you inside the baseball universe, from humidors to stuff plus <laughs> to walk-off dingers. We have you covered. Spend your afternoon with us only on A's Cast Live. Here's Chris Townsend. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of A's Cast Live. It is Tuesday, and the A's are back on the road taking on the defending champs, the Texas Rangers. For some reason, it still doesn't ring right. And I'm not taking any shots at the Rangers. I'm just saying, Rangers, World Series champion, it just still seems odd to me. Commander Cody, I hope you had a wonderful day off. Am I wrong by saying when I think world champs, I still just don't think Texas Rangers? No, I don't think you're off. I mean, I still think people are used to it. I mean, you know, people of my generation and, and, and older have watched the Rangers play in the World Series in 2010, 2011 with Wash and Michael Young and Nelson Cruz and all those guys. But, uh, yeah, it's a little bizarre to hear Bruce Bochy, World Series manager for the Texas Rangers, not the San Francisco Giants. It's uh, they, Yeah, they had a good How's team last year. How's it not? How's it not? I mean, it's like they had a good team. They didn't win their division. They floundered at the end, got hot at the right time, but that is baseball. And the A's are taking on the defending champs today, coming in with the defending champs, looking good in the first two games of the series against the Houston Astros, then lose the next two. So it was a lone star split. Well done. I didn't do that. Uh, it's been a while since we've been on, so the, all the jokes will be flying. It's been like a week. <laughs> a lone star split, but the A's, come on, out, outscored Detroit the last two games, 11-1. to one. If it wasn't for that home run, would have been back-to-back shutouts. Let's see what kind of mojo the A's have going into this series. Because we said, and going to stick to it, this team is better than last year's team by leaps and bounds. Well, they didn't look at, like, you know, one and seven homestand made us look like homers and made us look like liars. Trust me, if they, if, if I felt they were going to be like the 112 loss team, I would have not been fired up for it. I would have done the interviews of spring training. I would have got, I would have got, I would have done my job, but I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been like, Hey man, this team's going to be way better. Why? When to be our, our, our show has been nothing but honest since it's come on the air. And until further notice, no one's told us not to be that way. So when guys are bad, like for instance, I'll just give you one. We hated Ruiz going down. I hammered it on post game. I let people hammer it on the phones. We hammered it on here. I just think it was a bad move. So if something is not good, what we think it's going to be, we don't sit here and just go, oh, well, you know, we're going to, we're just going to cheerlead and pom pom. No, I mean, looking at this team, what we saw at AAA, we thought they were, we didn't, we were not, we were not making bets with anybody. We were not doing anything about last year's team or the year before. We're like, oh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. You know, what you have, I mean, every new team, you got, there's going to be hopefully some positives, but there was no, Oh, yeah, this team's going to win X amount of games. God, no, we didn't do that. This year we did because there was a belief. So I'm really curious about this series. Because if they do have a good series, I start to wonder, wow, was was that first homestand just a lot of bad mojo going on? There was a lot of bad... You pulled into the parking lot, and it is what it is. There was just a lot of bad mojo. There was just a lot of ugh going on. And it's hard to be successful in that. And now you 
come out of the gates and you you know Detroit was a team that everybody's like oh the Detroit Tigers it's the hottest start they start bringing up 1984 one of the greatest baseball teams of all time the 84 Tigers who went 35 and 5 and then blew everybody out all the way through the the World Series they were a juggernaut with so many great players and it was like slow down 84 Tigers so the A's went in and, and played well let's see how they do in Texas cuz they have another good series in Texas okay now we're really starting to see the team we thought like I put it this way if they go in and win this series cuz already I sent you already on one MLB power rankings the ever way too early power rankings <laughs> A's aren't last right they were dead last all year yeah. long last 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 and every writer took every shot you go in and win this series and you went back to back road series against the defending champs and the hot chic AL central pick, the tigers, all of a sudden there'll be a different, there'll, there'll be a little, Oh, okay. This is, this is different than last year. And that's all we're saying. It's different than last year. I, I have gripes with power rankings, especially this early in the season. Um, I, I saw the one that MLB did where they didn't, they weren't kind to us, which, you know, whatever. And then the athletic had us ranked, not last. The one you sent me, not last. My big gripe, and I'm going to say it because they're 9-3 and three now for blowing a game today, are the Pirates were 17th in the Athletics Power Rankings. How was a team that's 9-3 and three ranked below the Giants, who have how many wins? Three? Four? How are the, how are they? So the Tigers I think were, they got five. I think okay. the Tigers were 20th the in, in the, in the, in the uh, Athletics Power Rankings. So I just don't – Power Rankings don't mean anything right now to me. It's great to see the A's not last, which is awesome. I mean – the White Sox. Oh my God! They've been shut up four times in ten games. That, that's not good. Giant, that, Giants are four and seven. Yeah. Diamondbacks four and seven. Padres big win last night. I don't know if that's a big win. The comeback. It's a crazy win. Yeah. Right. Down eight nothing and they come back. Um. Of course, here we are talking about the A's. And power rankings, and you got to bring it back to the Pirates. That's your that's your dispute is the Pirates. Of course, it was. Well, they the started Pirates. they started great last year, and they fell apart. Let's see if they can hold steady this year. All right, who we got? So I'm back from Disneyland. I did the one day Disneyland trip with the kids. My kids got into college, so I rewarded them with a one day. And when you work in baseball, uh, you got to take your days off when you can. So after it's set up perfectly, right? Detroit early game, fly down. Sunday night, and then get up early, Disneyland all day, get up early today, fly back home. Wow. A full day, 8 a.m. to midnight, the entire day. It's a long time at Disneyland. It's a long time. When you got, when you got like 20-something thousand steps, I don't keep steps, but my daughter's watch does. When you're at like 20-something thousand steps and the sun hasn't gone down yet, it's pretty high. I mean, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah. You know, you're in trouble. Like at some point your feet hurt so bad. Like it doesn't matter if you stop, you're going to keep going. Yeah. So I get where you're coming from. It's one of those. Cause you're constantly walking. Uh, you never stop. Well, you never stop walking or standing. Yeah. Then when you do sit down, you don't sit down for very long. You eat, then you're ready to go back and start riding more rides. Because... Well, if you ride the ride, the ride at, at most is what a minute, two minutes. Uh, yeah. It's been kind. And that that's like the only time you sit. From 8 a.m. Yeah. till midnight? It's a long time. What time's the park open? Time. It was 8 a.m. Oh, wow. I'm used to opening it like Rope 10. drop, baby. You got to be there at rope drop. Oh. I haven't been there in a while. It was like two years ago when we last went. So, Full day Disneyland. I Last night, I thought, wow. Because we used to do three days and do the park hoppers for three days. And I started to realize, man, I was a lot younger when we used to do that. Because <laughs> this was one day, just Disneyland. Blew away through third. What do you normally do in steps? Your steps, guy. Uh, well, it's okay. So I'm, mine's a little biased. The last like month and a half, I've been doing twenty thousand a day. Yeah, we're blown. This probably was over forty thousand yeah. steps. The daily average is ten, and I'm doubling. And you're probably going close to thirty or forty at this. For level. someone who's not doing that every day or anybody yeah, like yeah. they, I mean, it was it was, but it was a blast, a lot of fun. Um, being down there, saw A's gear. Yeah, Couldn't I, believe it. Yeah, I see that a lot when I'm down there too. Like, wow. A shirts, A's hats. I was like, right on. I had my San Jose State shirt on. Got some love for the, the old Spartans there uh, at Disneyland yesterday. But a fun time. You know what? In the end, riding rides. 
I don't care. It wasn't that packed. But just sitting around riding rides all day long, come on. Can't beat it. That's what I was going to say. I, I didn't know how many people were there. It was Monday, so I don't know what the... the well, uh, it's spring break, right? So my kids have spring break. By the uh, way, who do we got on the show today? So I, Mike, just, I just landed in yeah. town. I'm ready to rock. Uh, Mike Bassick, who does Rangers pre and post on television for Bally's. Um, also pitched in the big leagues. He, yeah, I won't say what home run he gave up, but he gave a pretty big home run to someone in the that'd Bay Area. be the the Barry Bonds home run. Correct. And yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Henry Aaron passing Babe Ruth. That was yesterday. Uh, so they celebrated in Atlanta. We'll have Ben Lindbergh, who works for the Ringer, wrote a fantastic article, very long but very in depth about the pitching injuries and what do you say? Essentially, velocity and you know, all that stuff. Okay. It's not not blaming the pitch clock. And then uh, we have our interview with Mark Kotze We're gonna replay from because oh. uh, we talked to Kotze over the weekend. When was that? Uh, Saturday. That was Saturday. Yeah. So Mike Vasic, two thirty. Ben Lindbergh of the Ringer at three, and Mark Kotze. We say three thirty. Could be three thirty or four. Well, it's it's flexible. Okay. So this gives me some time. Obviously, the big news we've already had multiple guys go down today. Uh, Josiah Gray of the Nationals, who was supposed to pitch tonight against the Giants, he's on the injured list with a right elbow slash flexor tendon strain. Nick B- Nick Pavetta, who pitched against the A's on Wednesday at the day game at the Coliseum, he's now on the injured list with a similar injury. We saw T.J. Antone from the Reds. He's not going to have maybe his third Tommy John surgery. It Spencer ri- Strider. Antone, it ripped. I sent you the thing. Yeah. It ripped off the bone. Yeah. He's already had two Tommy John surgeries. Two. This is his third go around. It He's what, 30, 31? Yeah. It ripped. Whatever procedure he had done ripped off the bone. His first Tommy John, like a lot of these guys, Spencer Strider, first Tommy John. All done way before pitch clock. There's no pitch clock. Yeah. That's why I hate seeing people blame it. This epidemic going on has been going on well before any pitch clock. And it's something that we, you know what? Sometimes I like to pat us on the back. We've been, we've been kind of ahead of stuff. We've been talking about this for a long time. Problem, 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 problem. It's epidemic. It's an epidemic of chasing velocity and chasing spin. It's an absolute epidemic. But I like to use other sports. There was a time where the National Football League was selling ooh videos. They called them ooh videos. And ESPN, their partner, had the ooh segment on uh, their NFL show. But they were selling hard hit videos on the NFL's website back in the day. DVDs. Do you remember that? Yes, I'm, I'm thinking of the segment on NFL. Though, it was you, called Ooh, Ooh Hits. Well, I, I remember you got jacked up as one of the segments they oh. did, too. So they used to do this, right? And they were profiting off of it. And then all of a sudden, here came the concussion lawsuits. Guess what happened to those Ooh Hit videos? Guess what happened to those huge hit segments on ESPN? Yeah, those don't really happen anymore. They're gone. He gone. Why are they gone? Because there were lawsuits. What? There's two things I want to get into quickly. What did my father always say, Cody? What did my father always say? Well, you've been using the Arnold Palmer quote so much. That's only what I've been sticking to anymore. Um, Follow the money. Follow the money, yeah, okay. Follow the money. Baseball seems to get into these issues, and all sports leagues do. The NFL with the concussions. The NFL, or I should say Major League Baseball, gets into these problems, or these issues, and then they don't help themselves out. They had the drug problem in the 80s. They had the steroid problem and the performance-enhancing drug problems through the 90s into the 2000s. They got a problem right now. And this is self-created. Now you could you could you could fight me on the whole PED things because the players union fought it whatever but in the end you knew your players were taking it you were not doing anything about it the players don't own the business you weren't testing them now they can all say well you weren't testing but the players union remember folks the players union fought major league baseball on testing forever ever claimed they'd have a holy war over it but in the end it's your business and you weren't testing them you knew it was going on. 
But this one is a total self-created problem. Because we know the harder you throw, the more they're interested in you. The harder you throw, the higher you're going to get drafted. The harder you throw, the more money they're going to give you. They have created this world, velocity, spin, and this is what they care about. And all of a sudden, I get it from the team side. But when the when the players union now wants to say, and Tony Clark wants to say, it's the pitch clock and these guys want to, because what they don't want to do is they don't want to get to the root problem. It's the chasing of velocity and spin. And the reason why they don't want to get to the root problem is because they know if you have velocity and you have spin, you're going to get paid. That's how to make the money. And if we tell you, wait a minute, how you're making the big bucks is going to get you hurt. Same way back in the day, you take steroids, you have big, big numbers, you get paid. Right? Follow the money. I'm going to take the, the needle in my butt. I'm going to take testosterone. I'm going to take, I'll take all this stuff. I'll take greenies. Whatever helps me perform, I'm going to do because I want to get paid. Follow the money. My dad always said it, and he was right. So those guys were willing. Jason Giambi took stuff that all of a sudden tumors started growing his body. Thank God they weren't cancerous. But he had problems because tumors were because it because it it, um, it it makes stuff start to go faster inside yourself. Like there's a term, medical term for it. I don't know. Can't remember what it was. But like it, like all of a sudden the tumors that weren't supposed to grow start growing in Giambi. And next thing you know, he's giving a press conference saying sorry, but he won't say what he's saying sorry for. Like it was ridiculous. But you take steroids, you take performance, you take the clear and the cream. Balco, you're going to get paid, man, because your numbers, 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 numbers. Well, this is our new version. We know you throw harder, and the more you, to make this ball spin, however you want to make it spot sideways, up and down, I mean, however you want to make it spin, the harder you throw it, the more it will spin. We know that, right? We know it. We don't, I mean, Statcast is based off radar. We've been using this since 2015. We have all we and they know they know which the spin rates that work and they want to get pitchers to those rates. Well, the human arm can't sustain it. So instead of saying, boys, this doesn't work, they're now going to try and right now put a bandaid on, say it's pitch clock. And you're like, dude, you guys. You guys are the problem. You just don't want to admit it. You have a problem. You know what the problem is, but you don't want to admit the problem. So you're going to try and mask it and put a Band-Aid and put duct tape over it and blame it on something else when you know the real problem. Because what you don't want to do is get away from trying to make as much money as possible. Pitch like Greg Maddox. Well, you're not going to get drafted right now in the first round if you pitch like Greg Maddox. Pitch uh, like Tom Glavin. You know, what, round, what round are you going in if you pitch like Tom Glavin? I'm no draft. Well, I mean, on this show, I'm the draft expert. You play but I'm no draft, draft expert. expert. Uh, I would say probably towards the lower end of the draft 20 rounds, the lower end of the draft, I would say. Yeah, well, where are you going if you're Jamie Moyer in today's draft? Oh, wow. He uh, pitched for 8,000 years. True, he did. But the players' union, the agents and the players' union, everything for them is about money. Who gets paid right now? Guys, you strike everybody out. So they want to blame it on something else when they're at, it's right in front of you. The chase for velocity and spin. Articles now are final. We're finally calling it out after all this time, but we have articles. Finally, they're looking at going, it's right in front of you. Orthopedic surgeons are coming out, and they're, they're finally bringing it up. This, this is the problem. So what do you do? And a very astute Commander Cody said something to me. And it rings true. Like, when... Do you remember what you said? I say a lot. So you don't even remember, do you? No. When are you going to investigate all this? And when are you going to investigate these throw labs? Oh, fair point. Yes, I did say that. So we're, you're talking about driveline to baseball. So the fa you're saying fair point, but the fair point's your point. True, it is way. mine. Yes. Thank you for remembering that. I appreciate yes. that. The fair point is yours, my friend. Yes, because you're, you're looking at the guys that, you know, a good, a really good example of this is Shane Bieber. Bieber wants He's to go case in point this offseason. He went to fix his velocity, went up like mile and a half to two miles yeah. per hour in his fastball. Where'd he go? He went to drive line. 
And he said he was his quote. I remember I read, read some of the quotes after he got hurt, and he said, "Now he's having Tommy John." He goes, "You know, I fell in love with with pitching in and all that." And it's like because you added two miles to your fastball. Well, how'd that work out? It was to his curveball. He added the spin to his curveball. So the max effort thing, which I've talked about for a long time, it's like this is this is killing your game, man. We started Statcast in 2015. The average fastball velocity, they're looking at, that's not average because average is a lot lower than that. Hold on. Look at the league fastball velocity and breaking ball spin in April of each year. Okay. So fastball velocity in April 2015 of 92.6 is now up to 94. The spin on breaking balls, 2000. 156 RPM to now 2,458. So we are throwing this thing way harder and spinning it way more. And what happens? This UCL, this ligament, can't take it. It can't take it. So are we going to, what are we going to do? That really is the question. Instead of being a bunch of pompous jerks, like Tony Clark and and the players union and I don't want to get totally on, on on Tony Clark he's just the one that's come out now and blaming something that's just ridiculous because do you have scientific proof if you throw this every 18 seconds or 25 seconds or 30 seconds or 40 seconds or what is it do you have no you don't have anything and we have a bazillion Tommy John surgeries before there ever was a pitch clock yeah, I was going to say the league, fi- the league fired back and said to, uh, that a study of John Hopkins, there was no correlation with the, t- with the with the pitch timer. And then if you look back, there is this is there's all this stuff is in the Ringer article that Ben wrote. Um, there's a there was in a, 2011, there were 111 UCL procedures. Last year alone, there were 263. And the biggest the, the biggest jump in UCLs is in is in kids. Yeah. And that's like so this is an epidemic that's just not we're talking Major League Baseball. We're talking an epidemic facing people under the age of 18. Children. Yeah. Children. So this, 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 this thirst for velocity and spin is dramatically affecting children. And it's like, what? Pitch clock. You got a much, 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 much bigger problem. Dr. James Andrews said the UCL, the UCL doesn't fully mature till people are 26. I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, but I'm just telling you, uh, Meister, the doctor yeah. that came up with the Brock Purdy bracket surgery, Otani surgery. You, you got some audio from him. Yeah. There's actually two different things. He was on, um, foul territory today. Um, which it's a big get to get him on to talk about this. Uh, he, he, there's two clips. One of them, he talks about the injuries and the other one, we tell him 21. He talks about the injuries. The other one, he talks about the horizontal break and how that's a big, he thinks that's the big, injuries. Okay. Let's, so this is Dr. Meister on. However, the ball is breaking, right? I mean, the reality is like, like you know, his whole thing is the sweeper, right? Yeah. However, the ball is breaking. It it could be, I mean, Liam Hendricks told us he knew his arm was going to blow. He just threw it till, he, till his arm blew. I right? also, I went back and got that clip of him saying that. <laughs> so it's like, it's like whether you're throwing fastballs, you're throwing, you're, you're doing a sweeper, you got a slider, you got a curveball, and, and if you're listening at home on athletics.com slash acecast, you can't see what I'm doing. But if you're doing split, right, split finger, this would be a circle change, what they say is good for your arm, by the way, a circle change. But if you're doing the split, which for years was late 80s, remember Roger Craig and the Giants were big on splits. All of a sudden people start playing because you split your fingers. When you split your fingers, you could feel it in your elbow. You feel it. I'm doing it right now. I can feel it. Right. So they thought that was bad. Uh, traditionally, your slider held on the, the seams right here. Is they able to see that pretty good? It's a little white, but maybe I can turn this down. Hold on. Turn the white down so I can kind of give you an idea. Most people have no idea when you're talking about these things, right? So this is a traditional slider. Actually, Mariano Rivera's slider was like this, but his was a weird grip. But a traditional slider where the two seams come up to shorter, usually this is what your two-seam fastball would look like on these two seams right here. 
That's what a two seam fastball is. A four seam fastball is across the wide part of the seams. That's a four seam fastball that that will go the hardest and straightest. When you need to throw a strike, you're throwing a four seam. When they say two seam, it's on these two seams that come together, right? You're throwing these traditionally. If I'm a right handed pitcher, as you'll see, it will veer this way inside to a right handed hitter and away from a left-handed hitter for a right-handed pitcher. For a left-handed pitcher, it'll go into a lefty and away from a righty. That's what two-seam does because the way you come across it. All right, for a slider, you're just going to go from the two-seam and move it over just a little bit, right? And really, for a, I mean, a cutter, it's not that much because a cutter, you're really still throwing a fastball. You have your curveball. That would be, you've heard about the knuckle curve. Who throws the knuckle? Ross Stripling throws yeah. the knuckle curve, right? Uh, we teach kids, I used to do pitching lessons, you teach them with the index finger to throw a curve to get their thing over. But this would be your traditional curve. So I give you curve slider. Oh, you want to go old school like Oral Hersizer. Remember the two seam? I went to the right of the seam for the slider. You go a little bit to the left of the seam. That would be the old school. How old or her size used to come at you with a true, you really want to go the old school, him and Fernando had that true old school sinker going, throw it like a football. So that those are different things. Way, oh, and the sweepers, you're just coming across. You're okay. It's a slurve. It's a slurve, essentially. So it's messing with the elbow. And you see everything that I'm doing here, you see with the hand, everything that you're doing is going to have a reaction in here. And that is our problem. And the human body, it's not a natural movement. And the human body can't take. All right, get to, uh, I want to hear the injuries for. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Meister, Meister on foul territory earlier today. Yeah, I, I guess I have spoken a lot more about it than than, uh, than any time in the past. I, I feel like uh, this is a, a health issue. And uh, this is the population of, of patients that I take care of. And, and so if I can offer some valuable advice per potentially at least keep the conversation going in the right direction and then, then maybe we can do some good here because you're right i mean the numbers are are absolutely astronomical they're through the roof um we're probably double what we were at any any time uh at this time of the year before um i did about 230 elbow ligaments last year uh i've done 70 just in the first quarter alone this year um the month of april i'll probably do 40 plus uh, and, and the preponderance of this is, is on the pro side, but we're seeing the same kind of spike on the college and the high school side. And, and I think that we've known for years that this increase in velocity, which has trended up as, as, has resulted in this, you know, this set of consequences. But, but I think there's a, a broader picture than this. I think the, what I like to call the designer pitches, I think has had a significant impact, uh, equally as well. Um, and I think that those of us that are seeing a lot of this stuff with great frequency are, are seeing these patterns um, over and over and over again now to the point at which I can tell you that I can look at an MRI scan almost and tell you that this pattern of injury is something that we're seeing with particular pitches. So we can almost look at an MRI and, and the type of tear and say, oh, this guy's throwing this kind of pitch. So that was him earlier today. There was a little bit more, but I figured I'd just cut it short. But yeah. Talking about designer pitches and velocity. Mike Bassick's going to be on, right? Yeah. Well, he he's going to know Dr. Meister. Yeah, very true. I mean, Ranger's doctor, right? All right. Um, Eric, so in this article that I got from CBS, Eric Cressy is, I believe, how you say his name. He's the president of Cressy Sports Performance and the director of player health and performance for the New York Yankees. So this guy is well-renowned, right? He put on Twitter, the focus is on big-name MLB elbows, but what should get more attention slash concern are 16-year-old studs having UCL reconstruction now. They'll be throwing 100 miles an hour in the big leagues with old ligaments 10 years from now. That's how this perpetuates. We have to think upstream. So this is the guy that takes care of the Yankees talking about, and it, you're seeing it. You, you have these throw labs and you got these kids that are in high school. I mean, how many times, how many times it takes somebody like a Spencer Strider, right? 
Spencer Strider, like all of a sudden he gets hurt. And people go, oh, my God, he hurts his elbow. Oh, yeah, he's already had Tommy John surgery. Walker Bueller's already had Tommy John surgery. Some of, I mean, you got these guys who are having Tommy John surgery in college. You're having these guys who are having it in high school. So we think, oh, we, they get to the big leagues, and you think, oh, my God, they're going to have it. And you're like, oh, no, this is their second. The guy, Anton from the, from the, uh, from the Reds, this will be his third. Yeah, that's crazy. And he's a reliever, too. Nathan so. Avaldi, yeah. how many times is he in his third? Multiple. Yeah, he's multiple. I mean, it's it's unbelievable how he's been able to sustain it. Do we have Mike? Yeah. Mike, welcome to Ace Cast Live. How are you? I'm doing good, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Is it, was it loud there in Texas tonight? Well, the team's taking batting practice right now, and they jack up the music for the homeboys yeah. when it's time to take batting practice. So, Yeah, no doubt. How, all, all the different concerns right now going on, and you as a former pitcher, I, I just – I always say follow the money. We have taught everybody in baseball the chase for velocity, the chase for spin, the better you're at it, the more we're going to pay you. Every You know, everybody wants to get drafted high. Uh, Major League Baseball players, everybody's going for – I mean, you just had a guy like Jacob deGrom was the poster boy of unhittable stuff, and you can get paid just – as a as a pitcher, just how do you feel about everything that's going on and how sad it is? I mean, not, not just not talking about major league baseball players getting hurt, but you're talking about all these kids under 18 who are going through the, who are going through these major surgeries now. It's horrible. And here's the solution. I hate saying this. There's no solution because we want players to work at the highest peak they possibly can, and at that highest peak, we know we're going to hurt them. So if you don't want them to work at the highest peak to not hurt them, teams are just not willing to do that because they're going to say, well, the team we're competing against is asking their guys to go 100%. And if we're asking our guys to go at 90% to stay healthy, we might lose the battle overall. And maybe we keep guys a little bit more healthy, but they're pitching to the extremes. I hate saying it. Bruce Bochy talked about it the other day. He said the sweeper where you get underneath the breaking ball. Mm -hmm. He's like, that's a, everybody knows. My dad's known it who played in the 70s in the major leagues. You'll get to know who Tommy John was and everything if you get underneath the breaking ball. Now we teach to get underneath the breaking ball at in college and maybe even in high school and in the major league level to get the good horizontal break to get break going this way or this way. And we know it's a good pitch. But we also know it's going to give you Tommy John surgery. And the, all 30 organizations have decided we don't care. We want the guy for anywhere from two years to seven years doing this, and we know we're going to blow him out. We're going to blow out every pitcher in Major League Baseball within a seven-year period, but we're willing to do it, have them do a 15-month rehab, and then come back for hopefully somewhere between three and seven years. It, it just is unbelievable. But then it takes me to the NFL where we grew up thinking we want to have Jim Brown as a running back. We want to have Walter Payton, Eric Dickerson, a guy who's going to carry the ball 30 plus times. And then NFL team said, why am I going to invest in a guy like this? He's not going to stay healthy. Let's have three, four, five guys. Let them. So it's almost like Major League Baseball starting pitchers and even relievers are now like NFL running backs. We're, we're just never going to have the true star. You're just going to have a stable of guys because you know they'll never stay healthy. I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying that. It stinks for the game because growing up, and I know it was a long time ago, but in the 80s, if uh, Brett Saberhagen, Roger Clemens came into Arlington, Texas, Dave Stewart, you know, uh, yeah. Welch, it was really exciting. Not only did I get to see the Bash brothers and the Hendersons, but then it's like, oh, my gosh, Dave Stewart, Bob Welsher on the mound this series. You never get that anymore. Nobody cares who's pitching. Like, literally, even when it is – I know they're both hurt right now. Verlander and Scherzer pitched there last year in early September, and Scherzer got hurt during the game. Is It wasn't a – we were trying to make it a big deal here, and it wasn't a big deal. It was about Houston versus Texas, the lineups, the stars on the field. It's not about the pitchers anymore because, you know, best case scenario, the pitcher is going to go seven innings, best case scenario now. So you're kind of expecting both guys to pitch through five. Then when the game's on the line, you're going to have three or four different relievers per team come in per inning to finish off the game. 
that part of the game is lost and gone. I wish it would come back, but I just listening to Meister, listening to Bochi, listening to Verlander yesterday. Yeah. They, everybody knows it's over. And to your point, I had this conversation with AJ Hinch when we were teammates in Scranton Wilkesbury in AAA in 2005. And he wanted to get into front office work after his career was over. And he, he did quickly with Arizona and now obviously been managing for a long time. We said we would never, if we ever worked together, this is 2005, we would never offer a pitcher over a four-year contract. That was almost 20 years ago that we had come to the conclusion that it's really bad to pay a pitcher over a four-year deal. You have to develop your pitchers, pay your position players, and then after six years, once you use up that pitcher, you better have developed other guys because you don't want to pay guys into their 30s because they're going to blow out. And it's even, it's I don't know, three times worse than it was in 2005 when me and AJ were having these conversations on yeah. buses. Yeah. I would I would never offer a pitcher now. I would never offer a pitcher over a three-year deal. But that means I got to get some really good scouts, some really good minor league pitching coaches to teach how do I develop pitchers on rookie deals and arbitration eligible deals. Yeah, and let me remind everybody, you weren't a third baseman, you weren't a position player making this assessment. I hate it. I hate I hate that I'm a pitcher saying you should you can pay a premium money like Blake Snell, give him a two year deal at thirty plus million, but I ain't yeah. going over I'm not going over three years. Well, okay, let, let's get into the business then. If, if this is, if it is what it is and this isn't changing, I want to make that life-altering money. I, I want to I have generational wealth. If I can't get it in the form of a seven-year deal, is my best range now? The Scott Borses of the world need to go, well, okay, let's do it in two, three years, jack up the average annual and I want to get as much as I can, but I'm good. I'll, I'll only sign two, three years, but now that's how I get a hundred plus million. Yes, but it looks like organizations, and I, I know the Texas Rangers are right behind me. They might have signed the last pitcher ever to like a five-year deal at like about forty million a year in Jacob Degrom. Wow. I, I think I think like look at Spencer Strider. He's I, I haven't heard the news if it's official yet. I know he just came here to see Meister, but he's probably done this year and part of next year. Three years from now, when he becomes a free agent, let's just say he gets back to who he was. You want to give him a five-year deal knowing this surgery only lasts from somewhere three to seven years, and you're going to pay a dude $80 million over two years not to pitch and then hope that the three or four other years on the contract he can get back to the guy that he was? I can't do that. Maybe a few organizations can. Maybe the Dodgers can. Maybe the Yankees can. But – for the most part, most organizations can't spend 30 to $40 million a year on one pitcher who's probably going to be out during that five years, going to be out one and a half to two years during that five-year contract. This is such a real conversation. I mean, this is, I mean, to the average fan you hear this, this is mind-blowing. But this is, this is our business. It's hard to believe this is our business. This is where we are to where going forward – and you're a pitcher, just a reality. I know you're, you'll be an anomaly. If you don't get hurt and you have one of these Hall of Fame careers, you're going to be like the unicorn because everybody, everybody gets hurt now. It's like to have somebody who's Nolan Ryan or Roger Clemens or Greg Maddox or whatever, I, you, you, you just don't, you really won't exist in our game anymore. Chris, you know, it's crazy. I collect baseball cards. I still love collecting baseball cards. I won't collect a pitcher. I love pitchers. I won't collect them. After Verlander, Scherzer, and Kershaw, I think they're they'll, oh, those three are going to go in the Hall of Fame. Is there and, – and, you know, CeCe's already retired. Is there ever going to be another Hall of Fame pitcher in our lifetime? They're going to have to lower the standard so much to be like, well, did you win 100 games? 100 games is, is – and I don't think baseball voters will do that. I, I think they might lower it to, like, 200. But you tell me the next pitcher – Garrett Cole's out. Strider now is going to have his probably first major surgery. You start looking around baseball. I know Paul Skeens hasn't started yet for Pittsburgh. Paul Skeens within the next four years, I, I hate saying this. I don't want this to happen. I'll bet in the next four years he blows out. It's just the probability is likely he will, throwing 102 miles an hour at what he does. No, I don't think there's ever going to be another Hall of Fame pitcher 
after after these guys that just retired and then the guys that are close to 40 years old retire, I can't tell you how you're supposed to get into the Hall of Fame as a pitcher and compete with who's in the Hall of Fame and say, well, you deserve it. Yeah, it, it, and then you're going to have to go to a guy like Tommy John, who's the reason – uh, we even have this surgery to this day. A guy that won like 270 something games that had like 90 no decisions. You'll look at him. Then you'll look at someone like our own Dave Stewart, or you'll look at Kurt Schilling, or these guys who have 200 wins. They're not in the Hall of Fame, and you're now allowing a guy in who has 100 wins. So it's gonna it's gonna get really weird when we talk about the Baseball Hall of Fame and pitchers. Now we saw Connecticut last night win back to back national championships. We've seen back-to-back in all these different sports. The one sport, you can't go back-to-back. It's been a long time. It's since the Yankees did it way back when. Uh, just how the vibes around the the, the Rangers to start the, the season because now they're on the board. They're the one chan- They're the one team now with a chance to try and go back-to-back. It's feeling good here. Obviously, the last two days, Houston coming into town, you beat them the first two, you lose the next two. You don't feel as good. But this is a the offense when they're healthy. Josh Young already hurt, but when they're healthy, this is arguably the best offense in all of baseball. And now with Wyatt Langford and Evan Carter, it's it's really fun to watch this team offensively, and they can put up a five spot on you in any inning without you knowing it. You blink your eye, you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? But that being said, one of my buddies, Mike Coplock. He's a scout for the Phillies, and he was following the Rangers throughout the playoffs for the Phillies. And he's like, Mike, I don't know how you guys are doing this because you only have four pitchers. You have Evaldi, you have Montgomery, you have Spores, and you have LeClerc. And he's like, I'm telling my my Phillies, I'm telling them, if you face any other pitcher on the Rangers, you should be able to get runners on base. You should be able to have opportunities to score runs. But yet he's like, offensively, this is devastating, and it's very scary for other teams to face. Well, Montgomery's not here anymore. Evaldi's pitching tonight and off to a great start. It'll just be interesting. Can Scherzer come back in mid to late May and look pretty good? Jack Leiter, number two overall pick, he's off to a pretty good start in AAA. Can he help at some point during this year? And then how healthy can you stay? Sports is already hurt, and we don't know when he's coming back. So now you're relying on Yates and Robertson, two very veteran guys who've had a lot of success in the major leagues, but guys that are past their prime. Can they hold on and, and, and be with this team for a whole year healthy and contribute? I hope so. But that's what makes it so tough is usually because your pitchers have to pitch a whole nother month in the most stressful situations against the best teams in the game. They usually get fatigued more the next year and at times get hurt more than a year because of the extra stress they put on their arms. You know, it's crazy you mentioned uh, Evaldi. He's a guy that for many years, whether it was with Boston or New York, where you held your breath every single time he he took the mound, like, is he going to get hurt again? But now his story is going to be the norm versus back in the day it wasn't. It's just uh, Let's end on this. Uh, with a name like Wyatt, I'm like, you can't ha- you can't play for a better team than the Texas Rangers. How many giveaways are they coming up for for a guy like Wyatt in Texas? It'll be interesting. It'll have to be in the second half of the season because it's first half of the season. Yesterday was Evan Carter, the catch against the Houston Astros against the wall. Then coming up is uh, Marcus Simeon, a uh, home run that he hit in the ninth inning against Arizona to kind of clinch the World Series. Awesome. We have the World Series trophy giveaway coming up. We have the Corey Seager home run in game one of the World Series. So the whole first half, there's like 12 giveaway bobblehead stuff that everybody's excited about because first time ever we've won the World Series. Yeah. So the second half could be maybe more giveaways based off of what's happening right now. But Wyatt Langford, I hate saying this and it's not fair to him, but, man, if you kind of squint your eyes, you're like, is that Mike Trout? He's not as good as Mike Trout, but the body, everything, wow. is, is Mike Trout-like. And he, it's not fair. Mike Trout is, once again, the best player in the game when healthy. But his body structure and everything is very similar to Mike Trout. His speed is very similar to Mike Trout. His raw power is very similar to Mike Trout. 
Fascinating. Hey, this was fascinating stuff. And I know you got to go do TV. I appreciate the time. We gave you a little warm up, but uh, really, really good stuff. Let's do this again. And and by the way, this was, I think for a lot of people, this is from a former major league pitcher. It's going to be really eye-opening stuff. We appreciate the time. Thanks, Chris. That was awesome. I mean, that was, I, what it, what, I, my God, that's 05. He and AJ Hinch are talking about, I never give a pitcher over four year deal. We have said over and over again about how you're going to average 12 to 13 starters. Stop telling me about your five coming out of spring training. God, what's his uh, Anaheim? Oh, Perry Manassian. Perry Manassian. Can't, I, I don't even remember when it was. Was it? It was like two years ago, I think. Was I reading it or would I hear it? It was on. I think it was on. I think it was on. Uh, Sirius XM. That might have been. I remember the GM. He had just gotten the job. Yeah, so it was like two. Because he ago. he he worked for the Rangers. Yep. He had just Perry Perry Manassian was working for the Rangers. Got the job as general manager of the Angels for Billy Epler, who's now. Whew, uh, but. Perry Manassian said, you're going to average 12 to 13 starters a year. And it blew my mind. Like, what? We used 24 last year. 24. That's disgusting. Is it? Do we have to, like, reboot? our mind? Like, Mike Bassick, former Major League pitcher, just told you, doing Rangers TV, listen, folks, you might have seen the very, very last five-year big-time deal ever for a pitcher. Jacob DeGrom may have got the last big. Now, if that doesn't go viral, what he just said, like how would people not say, hey, on this show, this, hey, the A's got this crazy thing got all A's cast, and he just said that. People should be picking that up, that it will never happen again. You will never, ever see another pitcher get a five-year big-time deal again because teams know he's going to get hurt. Every team knows, no matter who your great pitcher is, Mason Miller will never see. I don't care how good this, according to Mike, no matter how good Mason Miller is, bring it back to the A's, no matter how good he is, he'll never see a five-year deal. None of these kids. Paul Skeens, number one out of LSU. This kid's got star written all over him. He'll never see a five-year deal in his career because they know it's money. Unless you're willing, unless, unless you have to do it to get the player and you know you're going to swallow it and you know your return on investment won't be there. I mean, best examples. How, how many big? Year, what, how many years did Jordan Montgomery sign with the Diamondbacks for? Oh. Well, probably the big thing is Garrett Cole. Yeah, Garrett he, Cole got three hundred million. Matsuzaka just got three hundred million. Yamamoto. 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 Not Dice. Dice K. Nah, he Dice K. Much. Got good money yeah. back in the day. Yeah, Yamamoto, yeah, Yamamoto just got three hundred million. Are we. I mean, how many people? Like, if Yamamoto goes down, Cole just went down. If Yamamoto goes down, people are going to look at it and go, what are you doing? Yeah. And we saw the guy that, you know, the biggest free agent pitcher in the offseason. Well, yeah, yeah technically Yamamoto just so Yamamoto will will be it won't be DeGrom. It'll be Yamamoto will be the last guy to sign a big contract. If what Mike is say, saying is true. Yeah. And let's face it. You, you know, what's so funny. It's like. I get it. We're, we're, we're in the A's world. So we cover this and we're we're. We know more than the national people do, but it's so funny when I hear people talk about us, I go, you know, let, let's talk some reality here. Going into last season, 11 teams were spending under a hundred million on their 26 man payroll. Remember that mm -hmm. there was 11 teams. Like everybody's focusing on the A's. There's 11 teams. the trend of where this game has been going. And now you see this off season with free, the trend overall. His teams aren't spending. Think about this. You had 11 teams last year, opening day, their 26-man roster was not a $100 million payroll. 11. And then the Bally's bankruptcy came. Then the bombshell hit. Who in their right mind is going to go out and sign with the, the rate of starting pitchers going down, with the chase of velocity and the chase of spin, and these guys going down, it's People are going down everywhere, whether you have a clock or not a clock. People are going down everywhere. Who in their right mind would call this a good business investment to sign somebody long term? 
to sign somebody to a long term with a lot of guaranteed money. It's crazy. And, you know, the problem that I have, I think I, 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 we like the guys at foul territory, but they speak from a player's perspective. They're insane. Some of the stuff they say that they put out there because the players, players value themselves. Players have no, I've said it before, really players have no value. There's very few players that have value. And I hate to say that because that's what we grew up on. We grew up loving players, but it's really hard to go around in Major League Baseball teams and go, who really has value? Who really here do people want to see? Like, I came to see that guy. Yeah, we want to watch the sport. I'll get, I'll talk about Pat McAfee today. I had to watch Pat McAfee because it was like one of the only things on I could watch on Southwest. The disgust for the Pat McAfee world which is a large part of America's sports fans for baseball is unreal. I could believe it, but then I could believe it, but I'll get into that maybe a little bit later, but I mean, how many, how, how, you're not going to build off pitching anymore. You can't build our game off pitching anymore. Hey, you mentioned a good, you mentioned a point and this is a little bit of poking fun at the giants, but a lot of people probably went to Oracle last night to see Blake Snell pitch three innings. Um, three innings. I know it's his first start, and you know but it's, it's, what, he's been innings. working out. You, yeah. Boris said he's been working out. He's ready to rock. He went three innings. Three innings, seventy-two pitches. They said he was going to be capped at seventy-five, but three innings. Three and everyone's innings. and and everyone's like, well, you know, he. We're not worried about it. the guys. Never pitch deep in the games. So to go three innings, and you're going to make you're paying him thirty-two million this year, and he can opt out. Three innings. I mean, he's winning Cy Youngs, and his best starts are five, six innings. It's only two more innings than that. I mean, yeah. seriously. I mean, Blake Snell. I mean. Just think about this. If you're, you're probably paying him around $1.5 million a start. Yeah, when you told me that. You, you just paid him $1.5 million to go three innings. Do you really think that's a good investment? Well, it's not a. You can't find any any random somebody else to give you three innings, three innings, three runs. You paid $1.5 million for three innings. That's why I can't listen. Like, no offense. I bring up foul territory. That's why I can't listen to ex-players. They're not realistic about life. We deserve this piece of the pie, and we deserve this. And you're like, if if you have a bunch of pitchers that are not giving you innings, they're worth they're worth you know what they're worth they're worth the minimum. You're interchangeable because you're year to year. I don't know what you're going to be. You're all worth it, and that gets back to what we've talked about for years about the positionless staff. We got 13 guys, and you can start, you can close. We all can do everything. Today, it, t- today will be different. Today, you start, I come in. Then two days later, I start, you come in. The days of this guy's pitching today are over. And interesting, our, our next guest at three o'clock, Ben Lindbergh of The Ringer, one of the things he mentions in the article is uh he's a he's a he's a fan of taking it from 13 to 12 pitchers and cutting down on the that incentivizes pitchers to How, pitch deeper and not throw as hard. And I I I get that. How could you do that at the rate of injury right now? How could you decrease and it'll be tough to ask Ben. He's a journalist. So really, like, like when if if you had a front office person, you said, okay, we're gonna we're going to give you less pitchers. This is this is gonna be a mindset thing that I need to teach you once again how to pitch, not to be a thrower. Because when all you're chasing is velocity and spin, and everything's throwing as hard as I can, I'm spinning as hard as I I'm throwing as hard as I can. I'm spinning it as hard as I can. You've got to go back to throwing strikes, throwing quality strikes, and not everything is as hard as I can every single time. That's gonna take that's gonna take years to do that through an entire organization, through generations of baseball. I guess bite the bullet, say, figure it out now. You want to keep you're, you're getting less guys. Well, I mean, we saw the change they made. I I went back and listened to what Tyler Glassnell said a few years ago when he got hurt after they they put the uh the, not the ban, but they cut back on the uh, the the enforcement on the sticky stuff, and they did that in the middle of the season. Like I'm not saying they're going to do it. I think it's going to be after this year they could potentially cut the roster from 13 to 12. But looking back, like I listened, to Mike mentioned it, and I told you about it. Like the stuff that Verlander said over the weekend when he pitched, I think he pitched against Vegas and AAA when he was at Sugarland. Um, it was fat. It was fascinating. It was like four minutes long. Maybe we can play it later, but. He just broke down everything. He didn't blame the pitch clock. He talked about how much velocity. He, he just went through everything, and it was really good. Hearing a guy like him who is going to be one of the last guys to get in the Hall of Fame with over 200 wins in this current era, it's, it's fascinating to hear from him. 
you want me to play four minutes of Justin Verlander, the space cowboy? <laughs> I forgot that's who they are. I'm these them being the Sugarland Skeeters. So what does he say? Like, what's he talking about for four minutes? I mean, I'm interested. I'll play four minutes of Verlander because Verlander is a bright dude. Pitch time. He talk, He mentions it, but he, he's not attributing that to it. He talks about velocity and guys want to be max effort on every pitch and stuff yeah. like that. And so everything I've been saying, you do anything at max. You do anything in your life. If you go out and you, if you're a runner and you're running as fast as you can all the time, you're going to get hurt. If you go out and swing a golf club as hard as you can every single time when you're on the range, when you're playing, I mean, golf's a four plus hour sport. So if you got to the range early, let's say an hour ahead of time, and everything you do, you warm at the range and you start going full go, and then you go on the cars, you play golf like that and you play a lot, you're going to get a hurt back. Like anything you do, the human body, anytime, like look at sprinters. Sprinters have a hard time staying healthy because they're asking their body to go to the max. Race horses to go to the max. Why do tennis players not age well? I mean, how many guys have really, and gals, played long time? Most tennis players, by the time they're 30, they're done. When you ask people to go to the max, they can't sustain it. The human, not they can't sustain it. The human body, the mind can. So your mind can sustain, your mind can trick you into believing that you can be Superman and you can do it every day, all day, right? Your mind can trick you into that. Your subconscious can trick you into that. But your body, your ligaments, your muscles, your tendons, they can't take it. So, yeah, I want to go out there. I mean, remember how hard young Tiger Woods used to swing the club? Do you remember that? You remember watching that? And everybody's like, oh, my God, this is the most amazing thing. Tiger Woods, look how hard he swing. How many back surgeries has he had? I would say, how'd that work out for him late, at the end? Well, he's not at the end. He's master's in a few days. Dude, he can't even get around. Now, I know he's had the car accident, but even he had the knee surgeries. I mean, it, it, it just, you can't take the body to the max. You cannot. You can't do it over and over and over and over. And over. Your body has a shelf life. That's why it's amazing. The, the 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 LeBron James haters, the fact that he's been doing this this long is amazing. I think well, he'll be 40 this year, I think. I mean, it's crazy. Like, when you look back and look at the numbers of a guy like Carl Malone, a man that big, that size, who played 82 games every year and almost every minute. Wilt Chamberlain played more minutes than there were for a regular season because Wilt Chamberlain played in every single minute of every single game, and then in overtime. He averaged more minutes than there were for the regular season. To have men that big do that back in the day was truly amazing. And there was no load management then. There was no load management. Will Chamberlain, <laughs> you're playing all game long. No one's coming out. <laughs> I'm tired, coach. I don't care. Stay out there. By the way, congratulations to UConn. Pretty amazing. And congratulations to South Carolina on the, on the women's side on Sunday. Undefeated 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 don staley's done a really great job with south carolina undefeated and then uconn back to back Danny I mean, hurley that is uh i want to pat myself on the back as the uh a's as i won the bracket challenge in the dude a's. you went chalk you t you took the defending champ and went chalk well if, if what was i supposed to pick san diego state to win the national I'm title just saying, that's how you he, want a bracket he's saying i mean if you you want to say oh i think ali's gonna win this fight and then you're bragging about it i don't think that's something to really brag the, about. the other one i finished second in well, I had, jordan's gonna win the championship oh really you're the smartest guy in the world i thought you i took you but i had him beating marquette that didn't really work out for yeah, me well but. how smart are you who'd you have in your ladies bracket uh south you, carolina you probably went iowa no you're i took so chalk. i took south carolina <laughs> you're so chalk. now congratulations to them that's um that's great stuff. I'd like to say I watched the game last night, but I was in line at a ride at Disneyland. I did. It wasn't, you know, there one guy on Purdue had an, like they had one guy on a team, one player on Purdue had assists. That's it. One guy. They had eight assists as a team. It was one guy that had the eight assists. That was it. You're telling me no one else could pass the ball for a shot. Do you know how bad my feet hurt at 10 o'clock? Um, I can only imagine. I mean, I've been to Disneyland. And had two more hours left. The grind was on. 
So you can't push your body to the max like that all no. the time. <laughs> See, I'm a great example. Going to Disneyland from 8 a.m. to midnight. 8 a.m. We took we went to downtown Disney at dinner. That's it. Jazz Kitchen. That's the only time I sat down. 8 a.m. to midnight, walking on concrete and asphalt. Yeah, I did it. And I don't feel good. You push, you put you push this Ferrari to the max. <laughs> How do you train for that? Uh, I mean, so how do you train to walk literally all day? I have a friend that's doing this thing in New York. It's called the great saunter. It's like a 30 mile walk around Manhattan. He does it every year. I don't know how he trains himself to do it, but it's a, that's nothing. 30 miles around Manhattan. How, what did I do yesterday? I I mean, I don't know if he did 30 miles. (sighs) And we, a lot of it was speed walking the way my kids go from ride to ride. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. We have Ben. Uh, yep, he's just joined. You think Ben Ben, ben will under Ben, I was at Disneyland yesterday. <laughs> We're talking about training these athletes. I don't know how you train someone to walk from 8 a.m. We're worried about these guys doing 103 miles an hour. <laughs> think about being 52. I walk from 8 a.m. till midnight last night. <laughs> I hope your knees are doing okay. Oh, my feet are killing me. Uh <laughs> You know, Ben, this is something we've been talking about a long time on this program. Uh, Not to say that I was some great pitcher, but I pitched in college. And I've been, like, looking at this for a long time going, all we're trying to do is we're raising a bunch of throwers, not pitchers. And everybody's trying to throw this thing as hard as they can. Now we want to spin it as hard as we can. And whenever you take the human body to the max as many times as you possibly can, it doesn't matter the sport. The human body won't be able to sustain it. And that's really where we're at. I'd agree with your diagnosis. And I think the the difficult thing is the prescription. What do we do about it? Right. So it's not so much a mystery why it's happening. At least I don't think it is. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about is it the sticky stuff cracked down and is it the pitch clock, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying it couldn't be more than one thing contributing to a, a trend this clear, but in my mind, you nailed it. It's that everything is max effort. Everything is throwing as hard as possible. I understand why you can understand why from players perspectives, from teams perspectives, you throw harder. It does benefit you until it doesn't because you broke. Right. But on any individual pitch in any individual game, we just know analytically it helps to throw hard. And so it's not just a major league issue. It's something that filters all the way down because people know, Oh, teams are looking for guys who throw hard. You're getting scouted if you throw hard. So it's kids in high school, kids in college, kids going to showcases, kids on travel ball teams, kids in Little League for that matter, you know, radar guns in Little League. There's cumulative effects of this, right? And so you look at someone like Spencer Strider. He's a hard thrower, obviously. He had his first Tommy John surgery in 2019 in Clemson, you know, before he even became a pro, before he was pitching with a pitch clock. The roots go deeper than that. And people have been talking about this as an epidemic for a decade now. And, you know, yeah, we're all talking about it right now because Bieber and Strider and Yuri Perez, et cetera, et cetera, you know, a whole flurry of them all at once. But this is a longstanding problem that something has to be done about it, but it's really a thorny problem to solve. And you got a lot of smart, smart people that you're around at the ringer and also fan graphs, a lot of smart people. And, and I just think about baseball, that baseball has created this. And Mike Bassick, former big league pitcher, now does TV for the Rangers. We just had him on and he basically said they don't care that they, they, they now know I'm going to have you maybe four or five years. There's going to be a surgery. I'm going to lose you for 15 months. I mean, if if we now start treating pitching like the running back position where we're not looking for Jim Brown or Walter Payton or Eric Dickerson anymore, we know you can't carry the ball 30 plus time a game. We're now going to have a stable of guys that do it. If, if we're just if we just accept that pitchers are going to throw harder, they're going to chase velocity and spin. They're always going to get hurt. Therefore, we can't rely on anybody. So let's just try and get as many guys we possibly can. How do we, how, how does the game go on like that? I mean, it's kind of scary just to be like, everybody's just going to keep comps, constantly having surgeries and everybody's okay with that. 
Yeah. I mean, one difference, I think, from football and the receiver, the the running back comp is that you can't just choose to throw the ball to someone else. You know, you can't cut the pitcher out of the game. You still need the same number of innings as ever. Right. Someone's got to pitch those innings. It's just yeah. that now it's many, many more pitchers combining to throw those innings than it used to be. But you're stuck with that pitchers. Is a great <laughs> point, by the way, because. I can now sit and shotgun in football and have five wide receivers right. and throw it every down, right? And not exactly. run it. Yeah, that's there's... great because in baseball, the outs and the innings don't change. No, I mean, someone's got to gotta throw those innings. So granted, we have more position player pitchers now than we used to, too. They might be all that's left pretty soon. But I think what you have to do, you know, I mean, there are many possible solutions. I agree that there needs to be one, not just for the good of these pitchers who are hurting themselves and derailing their careers, but from a spectator perspective, yeah, I mean, it's not fun when at any given time, a significant percentage of the best pitchers in baseball are on the sidelines and you can't really have confidence in anyone, right? Because any moment, any game, the UCL could snap. We could be talking, but there's no warning sign, right? So you can't get attached to pitchers the way that you can to position players. I mean, we all obsess over, you know, how hard guys hit the ball, how fast they run. When I see now that a Mason Miller's throwing 103 <laughs> or, you know, I don't say, wow, that's exciting. I think, uh oh, you know, that's sort of scary because we've seen time after time you throw max effort, you throw as hard as you can. That's going to take its toll. So it does feel like just the season, you know, swings now based on whether you win the UCL roulette, right? It's like, if you're the lucky team that doesn't have guys go down, great. Otherwise, it's like, oh, Garrett Cole's down with an elbow injury for a big chunk of the season. Well, maybe that changes the balance of power in the AL East, you know? Spencer Strider's down, oh, okay, right? It's it's all sort of hinging on who's healthy and who's not. And that's not what we want to see. You know, we want to see as many guys healthy as possible competing the best against the best. We don't want this to be decided by who had elbow pain, right? So, yeah, I mean, my <laughs> best solution to this, uh, I'm not the only one to suggest this, but I've been banging this drum for a while, is that we do need to lower the limit of pitchers on the active roster. That, to me, is the best hope for a solution. If you trim that, it's 13 now. If you trim that down to 12, down to 11, if you eliminate the loopholes, you know, the ways that teams can shuffle pitchers from AAA to the majors and vice versa, just constantly cycling guys in and out. If you really restrict them to, you only have this many guys to get through this game, to get through this season, then you are really incentivizing pitchers to take something off, to pace themselves, to go deeper into games, to not throw max effort all the time. And that pays all kinds of dividends in theory. It would keep guys healthy. It would make starters go deeper into games, which from an entertainment perperspective, I think most people agree is a plus. And, you know, maybe it lowers strikeout rates, more balls in play because guys aren't throwing 100 on every pitch. So that to me is, I think, the least obtrusive, most elegant, you know, closest thing to a pitching panacea there is. So that's what I would really like to see. But, you know, even if we do that, it's going to take a long time for the effects of that to filter down all the way to amateur ball to little league. Right. So it's taken a long time for this problem to develop. It might also take a long time for it to go away. You know, our pitching coach, Scott Emerson says all the time, I want big league pitchers, not minor league throwers. And I think people need to understand as a pitcher, a starting pitcher back in the day, we were taught you're not maxing out in your first few innings, because if you're doing that, you're not going to last. Mm -hmm. So if you needed a punch out, you would hump up on a fastball. But for the most part, it was movement and hitting spots. Yes, you'd have your breaking stuff. But now, as we see guys coming out pumping 102, 101, 99 right out of the gate and seeing them exit in the fourth, maybe the fifth, like the fifth. Like you had a guy in the fifth. Now you're like, whew, we got a guy into the fifth. <laughs> yeah. So I see what you're saying. So if I came to you. And I said, all right, let's get a let's get a bunch of smart guys together. What do you think that number really would be to really force? Because because everything we've been doing lately is forcing front offices to change. Right. We're going to change shifting. We're going to change stolen bases and bigger bags and throwing. A, we're constantly changing to make for front offices change. 
So if you got a group of guys together, what really would you suggest? Are, are you saying it's 12? Is it 11? Is it 10? What, what do you think would really get these front office people to change? Yeah, yeah. you're right. Cause you really do need MLB, the league to step in and say, your hands are tied here. You have to do this because you would think that teams and players that it would be in their best interest not to have everyone get hurt, but not necessarily, right? Because again, the numbers show you throw harder. It makes you more effective on a pitch per pitch basis. And you're telling a pitcher, hey, take something off here. Maybe it'll preserve you in the long run. I mean, that's a really tough sell to a guy who's trying to compete with everyone else, trying to keep their roster spot. And you're saying, hey, you don't throw max effort you know, while everyone else in the league is, right? And so how can you sell that to them? Because it's no guarantee that you take a few miles per hour off and you won't get hurt. And it's no guarantee that you throw max effort and you will get hurt. So that's tough from a team perspective too. Again, it's sort of like a next man up, you know, someone gets hurt. Oh, we've got another fastball slider monster in AAA here. And by the way, you know, we don't have to pay guys as much if uh, we're oh. using a zillion pitchers to get through the season instead of fewer. So I think, you know, you have to start obviously with 12, just lower it incrementally progressively. Cause even when they instituted the limit a couple of years ago at 13, there was pushback and there were people kind of kicking and screaming about that. Managers teams are used to just having these gigantic bullpens where they never really run out of pitchers. So they like it like that. I think you have to lower it gradually because, you know, if you changed it to 10 tomorrow, let's say that's dramatic to do overnight. You have pitchers who are conditioned to throw max effort. I don't know that they can just change on a dime and say, okay, now I'm the guy who pitches like they used to 20, 30 years ago where they're pacing themselves and only reaching back for a little extra now and then. So they might just throw max effort <laughs> all the time and still be throwing more pitches. And that would be the worst of both worlds. Right? So I think you need to phase it in gradually and do it over an off season so that everyone knows, okay, we're prepared. We're, training you know we're preparing in spring training this is how we're gonna do it don't spring it on them you know sort of like they did with the sticky stuff enforcement where everyone's scrambling to figure that out i think you just gotta gradually lower it start at 12 i think you gotta go to at least 11 and that's not that much of an imposition historically speaking you know like they would have said 11 pitchers on a staff oh my gosh what could we ever do with that many arms right so it's only very recently that that would even seem like a limit I mean, teams used to get through pitching staffs with 10 guys, you know, in the not too distant past, right? So teams would win World Series and only use five, six pitchers in the entire series. Yeah. So it's it's not that much to ask. It's just that all the arrows have been pointing in the other direction now. And so if you're suddenly going to say, okay, we've uh, seen the error of our ways and we're going to flip this around, I think you need to do that gradually so that you can do it safely. Then again, you know, there's not a whole lot of safety right now with the current conditions. So something has to be done just for the good of the game and for the good of these pitchers. So I I, I kind of got a an idea today as I hobbled onto the Southwest flight today, um, <laughs> as I felt like a pitcher about to have Tommy John for his feet. Um, I got to watch a little live TV and I, I turned on, it was ESPN two. I think it was Pat McAfee show was on to kind of give me the simple, simpleton basic sports talk audience view of the world right now. Right. That's, I think that's what mm-hmm. you're getting. Cause we're such in our baseball bubble. We forget like, how do, how do people really view our sport? And, yeah. Yeah. and some of the things he was saying and ripping our sport, cause they did a whole thing with Sean Casey today from MLB network about the Padres comeback win against the Cubs yesterday at Petco. And it made me realize just how the football, which is the majority of the country, the football simpleton kind of sports fan sports talk guy, how they view us. Man, we need some wins. We need something good about baseball. We need some like what's like what do we have to sell here? Give me something. I'm I you know, we got bankruptcy with our cable. We've got guys are wake mate, you know, there's always something that's negative about the game. Do we go do we got some positives going on in our game? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm surprised ESPN was talking about baseball at all. Shocking, I guess that's <laughs> right. And he talked about that. He's like, Why would we ever talk baseball? He he here's what he said. He goes, You waited three hours, Padres Cubs game. This that the the, the 
the numbers don't match up, but he's like, mm-hmm. you wait three hours of this boring eight, nothing baseball game for the Padres finally to come back in the last 40 minutes and make it exciting. So you had to wait. So I'm like, wow, like this is how these people view our law. Even though our games are shorter now, they still view it as long, boring every day. Not a lot of excitement. Like we yeah. need some, we need some positive wins from the entertainment side. Yeah. I mean, look, I think there's a lot that's great about the game. Obviously what we're ta- talking about uh, people like us who are already committed and it's true. Baseball does tend to really break out into the national spotlight when there's some sort of scandal, right? When there's the Astros sign stealing, you know, up until recently, I would have said Shohei Otani is that sort of uh, crossover mainstream success story. I think he still is, but obviously lately he's been in the spotlight for other reasons, you know? So, I mean, look, I think, Last year was a positive in the sense that the rules changes worked largely and people were talking about that and we're talking about the pitch clock and, oh, the games are speedier, even if that message hasn't fully sunk in. And yeah, you're going to get, I think, less coverage just because, you know, baseball, there are a lot of baseball fans, but it is a little more local and regional in the way that people tend to follow the sport. You know, they watch all of their team's games. They don't necessarily watch all the other team's games. For one thing, there are just too many games (laughs) to do that, right? But I think the big thing is the young players who are just so good and so compelling now. I mean, I don't know that we've ever had this many great young players from all over the world. That is probably the best advertisement for baseball, that you just have such incredibly talented, skilled, exciting, fun, you know, whether it's your Ellie De La Cruz's who's sort of still putting it together, just like the tools, the talent, the charisma. I think it's better than it's ever been, at least on the position player side. Not so much on the pitcher side right now for all the reasons we've been discussing where, you know, pitchers... Fewer and fewer innings, which you'd think would keep them safe, but it turns out that by limiting their innings, we've turned them all into basically relievers, you know, even the starters who are just like, yeah, max effort from the get-go because I know I'm only going to go five max and fewer pitches, but all of them max effort. So that's going to do some damage. That's a sad story. That's a negative story, but focus on how good these guys are. You know, the pitchers are almost too good for their own good at this point. That's part of the problem, just how otherworldly their stuff is it's superhuman i mean literally it's more than the human body can handle but at least on the position player side we don't have the same sort of dread of oh this guy's gonna break right we can buy into these incredible young players we have and i think that's probably the best selling point for the sport right now well i i'm i'm kind of hoping and i know this goes against the national television narrative But I'm kind of hoping like what we saw last year with with the D-backs, 84 wins begin to the World Series, Uh, seeing the Texas Rangers, who the A's were taking on Texas, were were there for the next couple of days, going to see them for the first time this year. Uh, Cody, my producer, is from Pittsburgh. The Pirates are off to another great start. See if they can sustain it. You Mm -hmm. brought up the Cincinnati Reds, who I keep joking, uh, the new big red machine. Uh Like, to get other people involved. Like, maybe this can kind of change the landscape where we have teams that are starting to, you know, because if there was a small market team that did what, it was the Rays, it was Tampa, nobody cared. But what if the Pirates, an old school, gritty, blue collar town or Cincinnati, like maybe we can revive that. Not, Not everything has to be on the coast. Not everything has to be Yankees, Dodgers. Maybe we could get that going again in baseball because that's when I remember as a kid, like, I didn't think of Pittsburgh as a small market or Baltimore as a small market or or name this. I didn't think of Cincinnati when I was a kid as a small market team. Maybe just maybe we could get that back into our game. Yeah, the ESPN executives are cringing right now <laughs> hearing you say. <laughs> My oh. table's dying. Streaming's where it's going. So Yeah, I mean, you know, they want the Yankees and the Red Sox to be good and the Dodgers probably. But I agree it's good for the game. If you spread the wealth around a little bit. And I think there is a perception that baseball has a competitive balance problem. I don't think it's a reality. I think that perception maybe stems from the fact that it's the only one of the major North American sports that doesn't have a salary cap. And so people in other sports look at the payroll differentials and they say, oh, this team is outspending that team by a multiple of whatever that must mean they're buying a championship. Right. But that's just not how it works in baseball. I mean, This year, especially, there are so few teams that were out of it when this season started. It's partly because the playoffs expanded, so you have more teams in it by definition. But 
also just a lot of teams kind of bunched up at least wild card contenders. That's exciting. You know, a lot yeah. of fan bases are invested. Like they feel like they have a chance because they do. And the playoff structure is sort of a natural barrier against buying a championship. You know, you can obviously give yourself a leg up going to the playoffs, but once you get to the playoffs, as we know, all bets are off and there are so many teams and so many rounds now that even the best team, even the highest spending team is not guaranteed of anything. So anyone has a shot once you get in and it's easier to get in now. So I think that's a draw, <laughs> you know, I don't know whether ESPN would consider it a draw that smaller media markets might be more competitive, but I think it's good for the game. And it's something that you can sell the game as, Hey, anyone has a, a chance. Cause it's almost literally true at this point. I truly appreciate the time. You're a smart guy. You do a lot of great work. Thank you. Uh, obviously fan graphs, uh, the ringer, but let's end on this. Sweeper is a big deal right now because Meister, the, the orthopedic surgeon who's going on everywhere, he's written about it, talked about it, coming around the baseball, the sweeper is really affecting the elbow. So if there's one trend right there that we're a lot of people are talking about, the sweeper pitch, not good for the UCL. But anything that you guys are looking at, an early trend, an early number, early something that baseball fans could look at, that's very interesting to see that, that that's in our sport. Yeah, I mean, the splitter is the the new hot pitch, I guess. Not that uh, people are throwing fewer sweepers now, but the splitter is making a comeback after kind of falling off. You know, it's so cyclical. There's a rise and fall with all these pitch types. It's like, oh, everyone's crushing sinkers now, so people aren't throwing sinkers. And then enough people stop throwing the sinker that suddenly the hitters aren't used to seeing sinkers. And then you bring back the sinker and now it's effective again, right? It's just kind of your rise and fall cat and mouse game. That's just eternal. Uh, so I don't know that I buy the, the sweeper injury connection personally, because I just think this is such a long standing problem. It predated this recent craze for the sweeper. And also a lot of research has shown that it seems to be just velocity. You know, the harder you throw it, a fastball is, is worse for you than a breaking ball on the whole. But it is really interesting to see just some of the data-driven changes in pitch selection. You know, sometimes it's it's guys who are creating pitches that they didn't have before. And maybe that's part of the problem that guys are, you know, on the mound in the pitch design lab all off season. They're not getting any kind of break. It's max effort, but it is really impressive, I, I think, to see guys will come back with a new pitch, with a new pitch mix. And, you know, it's the same guy, but it's also a different guy. So we're seeing more sweepers, more splitters, the sinkers making a comeback, fewer fastballs, you know, I mean, faster fastballs than ever, but fewer, just fewer four seamers every year because teams and pitchers realize like, hey, you know, these pitches that bend, it's kind of hard to, to hit those. <laughs> so maybe we can throw those more. So it's just a lot less predictable. It's another reason why it's hard for hitters out there right now. Whether it's writing, podcast, you're doing a great job with all of it. Keep entertaining us. We appreciate it. And let's do this again soon. Anytime. Thanks, Chris. Good talking to you. Appreciate it. Yeah, good stuff. Bid Lindbergh from The Ringer, from Fangraphs. And we had Andrew Bailey on, former A's Rookie of the Year, two-time All-Star pitcher, now Red Sox pitching coach. And they don't throw fastballs anymore. They throw far more breaking balls than they do fastballs. And their best pitchers on the injured list now. Their two best pitchers are on the injured list. <laughs> oh, speaking of that. Uh, Did you forget who they signed as a free agent? Yeah, yes, Lucas Giolito. Uh, Framber Valdez was placed on the 15-day injured list with elbow inflammation. I mean, he was scratched from his start yesterday, so <laughs> he's another guy. He doesn't even throw hard. <laughs> he throws a lot of curveballs, though. Oh, my God, man. It's never Who's going to start? Yeah, you're not going to have starters. You're just going to, hey, we've got nine innings. We've got nine innings. How are we going to get these nine innings? But, Ben, are we kept, I, I looked down, my God, we kept him a long time. But he's a smart dude. And I recommend everyone read the article on the, on the ringer, too. Yeah. Very good. It, it's, um, it's long. Well, but it, it's, it's good. It, well, it's, it's like David Forrest, our general manager, told us when, when I, when I was, questioning about how our guys don't go deep in games what was his answer get over it yeah pretty much well apparently that's what he said he basically said get over it <laughs> he i think he said exactly get over it we haven't had a we haven't had a complete game in two years get over it fact get over it i'm like you gotta be kidding me 
The general manager just told me on the general manager show, get over it. Suck it up, buttercup. No one's going nine innings. I mean, and I, what was I supposed to say? But I'm old school. They don't care. So the only way, they didn't want stolen bases anymore. Do I need to go back to Moneyball? I paid to go first. I'm not going to throw it out a second. I mean, they they didn't want stolen bases anymore. So what they do? They changed the rules. Made the bads, bags bigger. You can only throw over two times. Third time over, you don't get them. It's Bach. I mean, the only way you can change your game and to change front office thinking is to change the rules against what they want to do. They want to shift. So what do you do? Ban shifting. You want them not to use eight zillion pitchers? Only give them so many pitchers. Other sports do it, right? Folks, we didn't have a three-point line. At one point, Kareem and Walton and all those guys, this is way before our times, you couldn't dunk the basketball in college. You weren't allowed to dunk. So you can change rules to manipulate play. They've done it in hockey a ton. They've changed rules back and forth in hockey, trying to figure out how to get the game. Because at some... What Martin Brodeur and the and the uh, New Jersey Devils start? What what, what 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 years were those? It was way. Well, he played a long time, but they had that they had that half half ice trap thing going for yeah, years. This, the, well, it was like the zone or whatever. When um, was that? It was in the nineties. It was like the late ni- like mid to late nineties because they won a couple cups. Yes, and they were boring as hell. But you <laughs> had great defense in front of one of the great netminders, as you like to call them. The netminder in the barn in his sweater was really good. It's funny you mentioned that. I think that's the Sharks' last home game. In the right? barn. The barn known as SAP Center. In their sweaters. But yeah, I mean. That- yes. In a barn that's named after a tech company. That's how ridiculous the lingo is now in hockey. <laughs> well, we don't wear jerseys. We, we, we wear sweaters. And we play in a barn. No, you don't. You play in a barn that's named after a tech company. I, I, I grew up playing hockey on Frozen Ponds. So, I mean. I know you did too in San Diego. You played on frozen asphalt. That's all they got in Pittsburgh. Steel City, baby. What do you mean? I, I skated around on one of the three rivers. There's not <laughs> the Allegheny. What are, was it? The Allegheny? The Monongahela and the Ohio. They all come together, right? Yeah. At, at Point Park or the Point. Where is that? <clears throat> um, downtown, obviously. But like it got so bad there last week of the rain, it flooded. Like it flooded out the, it's like the fountain they have there and everything. It, a lot of rain Pittsburgh had. I said, this is the weather is just miserable. I said, this is the greatest (laughs) intro for opening day for the Pirates ever. They can actually officially, since it rained so much in the water rose, they can actually arrive on a pirate ship at PNC Park. So when I go, when I go yard at PNC Park, that's the Allegheny, right? Yeah. I can go yard into there. And that is like, I mean, hitting it into McCovey Co is pretty cool, but hit it into the Allegheny. That is a poke. Yeah. That is like a legit, you got it. There's not many guys have gone there actually into the water. Yeah, There's been the bouncing, yeah. yeah. Into the water. Is it a handful? I'd have to look it up. It's, it's not a lot. Yeah. Because whenever you, cause whenever someone does it, MLB Neck would be like, hey, man, this is only like the sixth guy who's actually – because there's, there's – there's you get it over the big stands in right field, and it usually bounces and goes in. To hit it actually all the way into the river is like a monstrous poke. Wow. How many home runs landed in the river on the fly? Only five. And Josh Bell. I said it's a handful. Josh Bell's done it twice. Uh, Daryl Ward did it in 2002. Garrett Jones. Wow, you're taking me way back on all these pirates. Pedro, Pedro Alvarez, the kid from Vandy, who was supposed to be the next big He only thing. did it once? Yeah, he was a monster power. So El that, Toro was his nickname. Was that just pirates or is that I think overall? It's, I think it's uh, PNC Park Allegheny home runs. That's, that's, let's look at the MLB. But I think it was just pirates that did it. I mean, there's got to be some road dudes that did it. Um, on the fly, it looks like it looks like they're just doing pirates. How many pirates have homered <laughs> into the river? Oh, I think it's if that's bouncing. But yeah, on the fly, it looks like it's just five pirates have ever done it. Yeah, it's 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 hard to do. Oh, how many home runs have reached the river? It was seventy as of last year have reached the river. Reached the river. Yeah, but that's not in the river. Reached it. That can be bouncing. There were forty-eight different guys that have homered into the river. Okay, all right. Still pretty impressive. Well, it's now the ballpark's been. It's 20 something years old. 23 or four. This might be the 24th season. All right. Seen, it seemed one. It's can seen, I go? Can we have some positives, man? Seen three playoff games. Oh, can I do one more negative? 
Before we get to Mark Kotze, yeah. Before I get some positives about the A's, we by should the way. we should play some sponsors too. I mean, I long know long. I got you know I'm I'm fired up. I did. I was at Disneyland is, is, all day. Is this long the stat yesterday. you told me not to look up again? That's funny. yes. Okay. It's our. The more you mentioned it, I didn't look it up. The more you mentioned it, and I'm trying to think of it. Does it have something to do with the Yankees and home runs? <laughs> I did not look it up. That's the first thing I thought of when you said it's funny. It's, it's already happening. It's, it's happening. It's already happening. It's already. It's 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 it's. It, as baseball is addicted to velocity, baseball media is addicted to the Yankees. It's a drug. It is a drug. They can't help themselves. It's crack. Yankees to baseball is crack. It's what the Dallas Cowboys are to the NFL. It's crack. They can't stop. And ESPN. They can't stop. <laughs> they can't stop it. Like you can't. Like I went to rehab. They're back on it. They cannot stop. Coming up next, it's already happening. I couldn't believe it. I'm trying to, I, I'm really trying to stay in the moment every day, right? And when I was gone, I'm talking about for all the games, right? I'm trying to make sure I maintain all the games. And when you, when you fly out on Sunday, Disneyland all day yesterday, I kind of lost track a little bit. But then I'm back on track today. All the games, got my notes, got every game notes and everything. And then I noticed something. It's back. Baseball's crack is back. That and Mark Kotze next, right here on A's Cast Live. Where does one community end and the next begin? Across the railroad tracks? On the other side of the river? Is it between the east side and the west side? At Comerica Bank, we believe it's all one community, and we're all part of it. That's why Comerica has invested over $20 million for affordable housing, financial education, and workforce development in lower-income communities. Because when we raise expectations for everyone, we all rise. Member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. Whether it's a midweek trip to the ballpark to catch a game or a weekend of baseball for the family, grab your tickets for an A's game this season. Secure your seats today for all the biggest matchups, fireworks, drone shows, giveaways, and more. Don't miss out on all the things happening this season. Rose and Seth. It's a drive into center. It's deep, and Straw is back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. So grab yours now at athletics.com slash tickets. That's athletics.com slash tickets. This is the place where you can dance like nobody's watching. Win like nobody's business. And get away like you mean so what are you waiting for? Come join the party. Take that evening out and make it a night you'll never forget. This kind of action can't be beat. This is Chris Townsend. I'm proud to announce our year two partnership with Link Soul. They've changed my wardrobe and they can do the same for you. And right now their spring collection is fabulous. Natural fabrics and versatile styles, perfect for this time of the year. And they want to introduce their performance line for golf, premium for on-course apparel design and to keep you cool and dry. Check it all out, linksoul.com. That's linksoul.com. Remember, look good, play good. If you're looking for a new mattress, Nest Bedding has you covered. Sleep on the same mattress Hall of Famer Ricky Henderson sleeps on. Nest Bedding is the number one brand of online mattresses and the Bay Area's favorite mattress store. Take home the Easy Breather Pillow. The New York Times calls it their number one pick. You can navigate their easy news website, nestbedding.com. That's nestbedding.com. Green and Gold fans, use the coupon code Oakland and you get 10% off your entire order. Nest Bedding, love where you sleep. You deserve extra. Extra Mile is where you get it. You don't just deserve breakfast. You deserve extra fresh Mile One coffee just the way you like it. You deserve more than a quick bite. You deserve an extra satisfying array of hot foods, extra good snacks, and fountain drinks that help you go the extra mile. Plus, with Extra Mile rewards, you can earn free stuff. Visit Extra Mile at select Chevron and Texaco locations. See program terms and conditions for details. If you haven't been to the Chicken Pie Shop of Walnut Creek, what are you waiting for? You're going to love the new menu, and it's a great place to watch all the games. Come taste their world-famous chicken pie that has been served in Southern California for 86 years. They have a new spring menu with special dishes and a full bar with new delicious spring cocktails. Spacious indoor and outdoor dining, perfect for your next corporate party or birthday celebration. Don't forget free parking. 
For more information, go to chickenpieshopwc.com. That's chickenpieshopwc.com. Nestled in the hills of San Jose, minutes from Silicon Valley, Cinnabar Hills Golf Club offers 27 holes of championship golf, a first-class pro shop, practice facility, and great food in the grill. This time of year also means family and business get-togethers. Let the folks at Cinnabar Hills make your event unforgettable while enjoying their award-winning venue. It's all there for you. Championship golf, a great space for any events, and incredible food. See it all at CinnabarHills.com. That's CinnabarHills.com. And the underdog Oakland Athletics win their first championship since they were in Philadelphia in 1930. Hi, I'm Raleigh Fingers, Hall of Famer, three-time World Series champion with the Oakland A's and World Series MVP. Winning takes teamwork, skill, and heart. So when you need an ace for a personal injury lawyer that will win you the game, go with the winning team. Call Venardi Zarata at 833-VZ for me or go to vzlawfirm.com. Bernardi Serrata, the official injury law firm of the Oakland A's. Streaming from the studio, A's Cast Live continues with Chris Townsend. Let me apologize to everybody. Um, clearly, I'm focused on the wrong things. I'm focusing on the major stories in our game. I got to listen to Pat McAfee. That's probably the first time I've seen Pat McAfee's show. I, I'd heard it before years past on Sirius XM. I have a lot of respect for him, by the way. This is a guy who was a punter. Soccer guy turned punter. Who now has made more money and has reinvented himself. And he signed like, when he, did he sign like a $100 million contract yeah, or something? No one, yeah. Proud of Plum High School. So if you do not like uh, from Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, Pittsburgh area. Yeah. So he he uh, <laughs> they're bringing up the Pirates today. I mean, he has it just total disdain for base football. People now just don't. Everybody used to like all sports. It's not how that used to be. But anyway, um, Cody's hair. I didn't bring it up, and Cody Cody said I hadn't mentioned his hair yet because I've been focused on you know I'm a me guy you, you are you if anybody likes Cody it is Cody so show him the hair yeah the hair is the uh the, the, the man bun is uh now gone the man bun is gone so you don't look like a dirty smelly European <laughs> soccer player anymore uh no um my barber's like you sure you want to do it I'm like yeah I think it's time it's like there's been two and a half years I think it's time so I don't understand like your hair still looks like a regular length where was the bun um it was my so my hair was a super long in the back like it came down to like right here on my back of my neck i mean the whole you explain this makes me want to throw up but please yes. continue and that's kind of how long it was so i don't know i should have my ba my uh, barber measure how long it was but yeah big changes so there you go uh by the way mcafee I no 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 back to the man bun oh uh, what about why, it why 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 the ridicule you got from i and i heard women I heard it. I was there when multiple women criticized your man bun. Correct. This was a this was a bun that was criticized by both men and women. Yeah, Amelia Schimmel, one of the biggest culprits of getting, giving me a hard time. Uh Izzy gave you a hard. I've heard yeah. multiple women make fun of your man bun. Yet you decided you 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 stayed on that get off my man bun lawn. Yeah, to hell with them. I said. Yeah, you were like, I am not switching. I am not cutting it. I I I will not. And then even my wife goes, oh, you cut it? I was kind of something like, I'm like, no, you didn't. So. Why did you cut it? Why did you let it go? Just was time. Time to you're make like, change. You're like, speaking of, you're like Elsa. Let it go. Let <laughs> well, it go. Actually, I was letting it grow, but. No, you let it go. <laughs> and now I did, yeah. Why? Told it was time for a change. No, no good news. The whole reason behind You it. look way better. Like your weight is down. Your hair looks better. I, I'm happy for you. Thank you. I'm trying. Fat guy with the man bun, I didn't think worked. <laughs> I'm just saying. No offense. No offense. As you offend me. It's okay. No I, offense. I, I, I love, no disrespect. <laughs> um, but no, thank you. But I real I want to tell you about McAfee. What's crazy about his whole thing before we talk about your crack set about the Yankees? <laughs> McAfee, the entire weekend was in WrestleMania. Yeah. So Friday he was in Philadelphia. He had every big restaurant, Cody Rhodes, Triple H, they were all on. Then he does WrestleMania. Friday or WrestleMania Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Then he does WrestleMania Sunday night. And then he does his show today. And it's all about wrestling. And I'm like, I can't believe ESPN let him get away. But 
it was fantastic. The way what he did, WrestleMania was awesome this weekend. Night two was fantastic. I mean, he I, said he got a tux off Amazon. <laughs> That does that does not. And that me. Friday night, the tux blew out in the pants, and that no, it's it's. Uh, I like him. I like him. I don't. I just can't sit there and listen to NFL all day long. He, I just I just can't. He pulled something off last night that I'll show you when we're done. But he did talk baseball with Sean Casey today, and the way they talked baseball made me realize that the average non guy in our bubble gal guy in our bubble they just the way they look at baseball it's like wow well, it's not like it used to be. You know why he probably brought Sean Casey on. Because Casey's also from Pittsburgh, well, so he wanted to bring. Well, Pittsburgh they were, they were on. talking about Cubs, Cubs blowing oh. the lead, and you know, making fun of it, but then showing the highlights and going nuts. And it was a great comeback by the Padres. But um, all right, we 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 put off long enough. Where's this Yankees? Where's the all Yankees? right? So here's the deal. This just gets me every year. Yankees, Marlins, right? That's a so it was what a couple years ago. Yankees were riding high, and it was in June. And they had the Yankees. They had all these different stats to back it up. And they said, well, the Yankees have done all this. They've won the World Series in 27. And blah, 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 blah. They had all the World Series. And it made me so angry that I came on this show and I predicted that the Yankees would not even go to the World Series. Check the tape, I said. We played it back, I'm pretty sure. Multiple yes. Times. <laughs> And our own Vince, and our own Vince Catronio, New York guy, he likes the Yankees growing up. So I like that. See, I told you, I predicted it. I hate the Yankees. I hate the Yankees. And this, this just drives, and it, it drives me nuts that my sport is addicted to them. They're addicted. Here we go. Here are the note. What, what, we're in April. What, what, what is the date today? April 9th. It's April 9th. April 9th. They can't help themselves. MLB Network, Major League Baseball, the notes. They can't, they can't, they, any chance they get, here we go again. Usually they wait till June to do this kind of garbage. First line of the notes, Marlon James. By the way, their game was like two hours last night. Well, yeah, well, the Marlins are, there's a lot on the Marlins we can get into if we really needed to. A.J. Puck going out. Your guy A.J. Puck starting tonight. Was he going to with a 90 yard? You want Blade or Puck? Who was right, me or you? Small sample size. But I'll take Blade right now. Oh, you knew I love that terrain. I was like, I'll take AJ Pac. I mean, I'll take JJ Blade. I'll take an I'll take an I'll take a JJ over an AJ any day. You know I love that trade. Get rid of Pac. Yes, sir. And you're gonna give me the guy who was a fourth overall in the pick. Oh my God. Fourth overall pick in the draft. I'll take that any day of the week. How is that? Who would you rather have right now? Probably Blade. JJ Blade or AJ Puck. Probably Blade. They had a rush puck. AJ Puck. 0 and 2 with a 9 ERA. Anyway, here, here is the front line of the news from MLB Network today. The Yankees. The Yankees win. Yeah, Jeter and the Yankees right here. Huh? The captain. Wonderful, as John Sterling called it. Juan, Juan Soto's home run. Wonderful. The, the Yankees look to win 10 of 12 to begin the. I don't know why I'm doing my New York accent. Yankees. Right here, eh? I'm walking over here. All right. The Yankees look to win 10 of 12 to begin the season for just the fourth time in the live ball era since 1920. Okay. Like, seriously? They need to go to already the historic 1920 a live ball era. It gets worse. Their addiction gets worse. Each of the previous three occasions, the Yankees went on to win the pennant. Nin 2003, 1949, and 1922. We're already digging up 1922 by April 9th for the Yankees. How do, how do a three work out for them? Josh Beckett, Jack McKeon, and the Marlins. Oh, that, that's a rivalry. Is this a rivalry series? Uh, no, they don't bring up Josh Beckett in the notes in game six on no. three days rest, shoving it down the Yankees' throat at Yankee Stadium. No Miguel Cabrera is a, whatever he was, 19 or 20-year-old third no, baseman. No, they don't mention that. They just mention that a start like this means the Yankees not win the World Series, win the American League, 03, 1949, and 1920. They can't help themselves to be addicted to the Yankees. And the Yankee, any kind of Yankee and Yankee, like every day's Yankeeography in our world. Like anytime they can get to something historic about the Yankees, they can't. It's like the Cowboys in football. It's the Yankees in baseball. It's their crack. 
the the, the best. Am stat, I wrong? No, and the best stat in there, it's not even there. It's in the very beginning of the notes, is about um, how how many home runs John Carlos Stanton has with the Marlins uh, compared to how many guys have hit that many home runs since. So it's like Marlin home run leader since 2017. John Carlos Stanton had 59. The next closest Marlins aren't on the team anymore. And Brian Anderson, I think Jazz Chisholm is like 53. Where is it? I remember seeing it in there. It was in there like super early. Like Marlin. Oh, home most run. home runs yeah. by a Marlin since the start of 2007. Yeah, they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. By the way, I got a stat for you. Yankees haven't been to the World Series since 2009. Uh, hold on. Let me, I'm looking, let me get on baseball reference. Uh, no, that's correct. 2009. I, I, did you, I don't have that in front of me. I just know it because it's been that long and it's awesome. You haven't won the World Series. You haven't been to the World Series since. And how much money have the Yankees spent since everybody's consumed about money? How much money have the Yankees spent since that last World Series victory in appearance? A lot. How many billions? How many billions is it add up to? Well, three twenty six for Cole. There's that. How uh, many you, billions have they spent? Spent a lot on Judge, um, A Rod, Teixeira, Jeter, CC. A lot of money they've spent to win nothing. Are they, are they paying John Carlos? I'm thinking they're probably they're nothing. John Carlos contract. Yeah. Glaber Day. Carlo, the, Carlos Rodon. Glaber has got to pick it up for me, by the way. Hey. You know, who's, you know who's having a hot start to the year? You know who's not having a hot start? Corbin Carroll. Oh, yeah. So these guys, listen, you, you, you want to talk about the type of people I work work with? They have the fantasy draft the day of my birthday when I'm down at spring training. That's when they do the draft. So I have to do the, the computer drafts my team. And everybody the computer drafted has gotten off to a horrific. Corbin Carroll's been terrible. Yeah. Terrible. I mean, when do I panic? There was an article today I was reading on the plane. When do you panic about fan your fantasy team? When? It's April 9th. When do you start panicking when you got guys? See, that's the great thing about fantasy baseball. If it was like Major League Baseball broadcasters, they don't panic until like, when do major? It's early. It's early. Every pregame show with the manager. It's early. It's early. Broadcasters. Broadcasters have endless time. Broadcasters in baseball think time doesn't matter to them. They've got forever. It's infinity to them. <laughs> to a fantasy owner, when do you start panicking? Well, it depends on what kind of league you're doing. Um, I'm panicking. Yeah. Well, some leagues like like ours. Incarnation is... Strand for the Reds, Bay Area guy I got, he's hitting like 119. Hey, you could have Francisco Lindor. You know what he's hitting? What? 0.75. He is, I'm surprised he's not on my team. That's how slow it's so bad. That's a really bad Look at these guys. Hey, I got Corbin Carroll. You don't have you don't have our good friend of the French Cuban Luis Robert, do you? I, I picked up Jackson Cheerio, by the way. That's a good player to have. Uh my guy Justin Turner, he's got no jacks, 268. Glaber Day has no home runs hitting 222. You know who's playing well for them though? Volpe. I got, uh, yeah, well, I don't have him. Oh, I got Castellanos with the Phillies. He's got, he's hitting 114, no home runs. I'm just going through my lineup. No wonder I'm terrible. <laughs> what, what am I supposed to do? You just can't change your team. I can't fire the GM. I have no GM. I have no manager. And my team, what am I going to get rid of? It? You're, well, you're full. You're full on Charlie Finley. You're the owner and GM. No, I didn't pick the team. The computer picked them. You can't put a team together on a computer, Billy. It's starting to look like uh, <laughs> Grady Fuson was right. The computer picked the team, and it's not doing well. It is not doing well. But there you go. Baseball's at it already. We got to hope the Yankees start losing. And next thing you know, it's going to be last time the Yankees had this best, had this good a record in May, they won the World Series in 42 and 44 and 66. Like, what does the Yankees starting – have anything to do with 1922. I, I saw everything is a talking. No other team gets this. No, what like A's got great history. A's got off to a great start. It wouldn't be like, you know, last time the A's did this, they won the world series in Philadelphia. They wouldn't get that. Yankees are the only, they can't pump this stuff up enough. It's disgusting. The one I saw was uh, the pirates haven't started nine and two since 1992. Well, 
if you're a pirate fan or a baseball fan, you know what happened you know, after I, that. I want to take it. I, I got to take something back. I made fun of them bringing up the 84 Tigers for the Tigers hot start. I take it back. You know what? You should enjoy that. Win some games. Keep talking. Hey, if they're going to bring up this garbage about the Yankees, <laughs> anybody can do whatever they want. I mean, this is unbelievable. And they're not even bringing up. They're so desperate to have people talk Yankees, MLB Network. And because remember, Major League Baseball owns and runs MLB Network. They're not even talking about when the Yankees won. They're just talking about when the Yankees went to the World Series. Last time they started like this, they went to the World Series. They're they're getting the hype machine going already. If only the Yankees, already. If only the Yankees had their own television network as well that they could talk about. This that wasn't time. failing. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh shots. I don't have any friends at Yes Network, so it's shots. Fine. Fired. We don't. Ha- we can't. We can't ever get Coney on. So I can't. shots fired. Yankeeography is not moving the needle anymore. Okay, I got that out of my system. That felt good though. I have a whole list of buying or selling before. Or maybe we'll do it after cocktail. But I'll ask you more right now because it's tying into the Marlins. Marlins. Skip Schumacher. There. They didn't pick. They determined his option mm-hmm. after the year. National League Manager of the Year last year. Term- Judge already won, and they fired him after the after he won. So, Different ownership, I know, but still, same. Still, the Marlins terminated his option, so he could be free agent after the year. You know, he could leave. He apparently wasn't happy that Kim Ming was let go, and they were going to hire someone over her. Buying or selling, Gabe Kapler will be the next manager of the Miami Marlins. If Gabe Kapler gets a third job, oh my God! Assistant GM of the Marlins. Well, yeah, why would you bring him in? I'm going to buy that. But he was Cap- a Marlin. But he's a Marlin player too. Right? I'm gonna. I, right? Was he? I remember him as a Ray. I don't know if I remember Gabe Kapler. I remember Kapler as a Red Sox, as a Rocky. Who look. out of all the teams Gabe Kapler played for? Are Friend you, of the program, uh, Dodger. Uh, he was a Dodger, if I remember correctly. Detroit, Texas, Colorado, Boston, Milwaukee, Tampa. So he never. Yeah, I don't remember him as a Marlin. That's right. He was a. He was a Tiger with C.J. Nikowski. His best year ever, he had 18 home runs with Detroit in 1999. Like, how am I looking at home run wise? I mean, he hit 82 home runs. What's his managerial record? That's that's what you want to know. Probably, it's got to be under five. No, 456 and 411. Wow. Remember, remember, he won 100. How many games? 107. 107. Game? Okay. I'll say this I'm going to buy it because Gabe Kapler is somebody. That has an it factor. Whether you like him or not, Gabe Kapper has he has an he has an it factor. I think a lot of Giants fans now would disagree with that. But Gabe Kapler is a smart guy. He is a good communicator. He is odd though. Yeah, fair. Yes. Okay. So he is odd. So anybody you talk, so like Ross Stripling, for example. I was kind of fishing for some Giants dirt during our interview, if you noticed. I was trolling out there, as I like to do. And Stripling said, or maybe this was off the air, but th- these guys, all, these, all these guys were promised, Farhan agent promised, this is going to be your role. Sign the contract. Sign with us. We're going to win. This is our role. And then they all got in there and felt bamboozled. They felt they felt rug pulled right out from under them. No, this is not how we're really going to use you. So a lot of these a lot of these players, and let's face it, they didn't throw the ball well either. So it's a lo- it's really hard to complain when you don't have good stats. But anyway, Stripling said they all like Kapler. Kapler's a good dude. A little weird. A little weird will be in my words, not Stripling's words. Kapler's different, I think, is what Stripling said. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that as I already know. He's a little weird. He's a little, he's a little, and weird's cool, right? He's like a cool weird. He's the guy that's out there. He's, he's doing yoga in the outfield. Kapler knows a lot about the human body. Kapler is very versed in, in, in mental health. That's not what makes him weird. There's a weird side to him, kind of a, kind, but I can see how Kapler gets in there. You like the guy. He's a he's a smart once a guy. He's a smart guy. Smart people are intoxicating because not everybody's smart. So when you're smarter than most people, people like you. 
because he doesn't play always. I'm the smartest guy in the room. When you're super smart and you play smartest guy in the room, everybody can't stand you. Cap, but that's where Kepler's a good communicator. There's somebody I could mention who I would say the name and you go, oh, yeah, I hate that guy. We both know him. He is ultimate smartest guy in the room. I can't say it, though, because it just it would be in very poor taste. I wish I could say the guy's name. But, yeah, Kepler's not that guy. But Kepler's smart. I can say I'm going to buy it. Kepler is your next. I couldn't even name Jeff Torborg, Jack McKeon. Tony Hardy. Ozzy Guillen. Oh, the first, uh, the guy, he's with the, um, uh, Freddie Gonzalez. He was one. Who was the first ever manager of the, uh, of the Marlins? Jim Leland. Jim Lee. That was Jim. That was Torborg the first manager. Who was the first Marlins manager? I know the first Marlins pitcher was, uh, the old knuckleballer, Charlie Huff. I'll never forget. First game ever. I'll never forget this. First game ever was Marlins Dodgers for the Marlins. Marlins Dodgers and ESPN pans the camera to the uh, bullpen and and uh, Charlie Huff was in the bullpen smoking a cigarette as he was warming up. That's when men were men. We didn't have UCL surgeries. We smoked heart darts. I'll give you the list real quick. Uh, Don Mattingly was a great uh, Marlin manager. Matt, he has most wins in Marlin's history. Does uh, he really? Yeah. Freddie Gonzalez, Jack McCann. I want the first one. Uh, Renee Lashman. Renee Lashman was the yeah. first one? Uh, then you got John Boyles did it. And then you got Mike Redman, Smoking Jim, Jeff Torborg, Skip, Skip Schumacher, uh, Joe Girardi, Edwin Rodriguez. Don't, who? Uh, <laughs> Ozzie Guillen, Dan Jennings, who was the, he was a GM, I'm pretty sure. Tony Perez. Dan Jennings, yeah, came down from the. Yeah. Jo, uh, John Boyles, Trader Jack. Tony Perez, that was an interim. Cookie Rosales. Cookie Rojas. Rojas. Oh, Rosa, yeah, Rojas. Cookie Rojas managed them? One game in term. Oh, and, then, and then our good friend from the Orioles managed one game in term. Brandon Hyde. They didn't know what they had. Yep, no, greatness was... from uh, Santa Rosa. They had greatness from Santa Rosa, and they didn't even know it. Now the, now they're winning. Now the winningest manager of Marlins history is a bench coach for the Blue Jays. Who could be their next manager? Let's be real. I like it. Gabe Kapler will get his third shot. Gabe Kapler. That'll be amazing. That that'll be another like, like how many times did Novell Tena get a shot at, at being a head coach in the NFL? Like certain guys that just keep getting these jobs. You're like, wait a minute, how many times can a guy get the head job? There's certain guys that are great. Certain people have a skill of getting hired. Not great at keeping jobs but they have great skill at getting hired. Everybody knows that person. There's something about them that makes people like them and they get jobs. They just can't sustain them because they're not good at the job. That happens a lot with hockey. A lot of retread manager or uh, coaches in hockey. Like literally a T will fire guy instead of looking for a new guy or an assistant or something. They'll just hire that guy that got fired. But that happened for years in the NBA, years in baseball, and years in the NFL. Yeah. Guys Ho get hockey is just really bad, really bad at it right now. But then again, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to find somebody like when everybody talks, oh, go get that offensive coordinator. He's great. Or go get that guy out of college. It's really hard to stand up in front of a group of, let's face it, young men. You got to stand up in a group of young men, especially in baseball. You've got a group of young men who are a lot of them are multi multi millionaires and have generational wealth. And you got to get these guys who are all pompous to be pulling on the same rope and, and do and do be selfless in a sport that has no loyalty. Like we try and act. There's no way. Look what we're talking about. Mike Bassick. We just had up Mike Bassick, by the way, if you miss it, we got to get up. It was fabulous. Former pitcher. Rays, who else? Who Rocky? Who was he with? Nationals. Nationals. Uh, gave up the big bonds home run that broke uh, Hank Aaron's. Nationals, yeah. That was uh seven fifty six. Yeah. Um, I'm telling you, he was fabulous. Where he goes, you're not gonna be able to offer pitchers anything. It's just a retread. Everybody knows. Everybody's gonna get hurt. So we're just going to now play going forward. You're going to have a boatload of pitchers, and everybody just knows your pitchers are going to get hurt over and over and over and over, over again. That's the way the sport's going to be played. It's like running backs in the NFL. 
Congratulations. That's sports. So whenever you guys get fired up about a Mason Miller, just know it ain't happening. Uh, uh, Mason was mentioned in the Ringer article, too, that Ben Lindbergh wrote. Yeah, we were all, oh, Mason Miller, this is so good. And now he's a closer because he can't stay healthy. No. no one stays healthy. So it's like getting excited about anybody who's a starting pitcher. We have David Force on Friday. I can't wait to ask about this. Going, man, we've asked you about it before. Here we are again. Here we are again, and nothing's changed. And your best prospect, your best pitcher, you've now made a close. What are we going to do? No one has the answers. No one has the answers. It's unreal. Absolutely unreal. Got a great arm. Don't fall in love with it. You literally cannot fall in love with a pitcher. Don't buy a pitcher's jersey. We always talk about pitcher's jerseys. Don't buy a pitcher's jersey. Right? Yeah. I mean, the only guy that we've seen over the last, like, 10 years has been able to stay healthy for the over the long term until this year was Cole, who throws hard. And now... His body or his arm starting to break down. He's supposed to come back at the end of May, early June. That's what they're saying. But Willie, we'll see. It's sad. The guy with the ball used to be a star. He used to love pitching matchups. Like he said, like Mike Bassett said, you know, you had Scherzer, Verlander. It didn't matter anymore because, you know, both of them are going to be gone in the fifth or sixth. Pitching matchups don't matter. I don't even know what pitching is anymore. There you go, Cody, right there. We'll have to play the Verlander tomorrow. Yeah, I, I'm cool with that. I want to hear it it's, before we play it. I want to yeah, hear it. It's, re- it's really good. I mean, I, I think it's good. A lot of people on social media liked it. This is, it well, was, you have a you have an all-time great. Could be the last guy to win 300 games. But you have an all-time great talking about a sport. A guy who survived not having Tommy John until late 30s. Yeah, which is incredible. Because he's a guy that he was a guy that wouldn't ramp it up until later in the game. He knew how to go deep in the game. He knew how to pitch. He knew he knew how to be a power pitcher. Remember, we used to talk about guys who were power pitchers. They knew how to be power pitchers. Randy Johnson learned to become a power pitcher. Tom Seaver was a power pitcher. Nolan Ryan was a power pitcher. Roger Clemens, they pitched, they were power. But it wasn't max every pitch because they were going nine. They were going nine. Even Dave Stewart with the strikeout. Dave Stu was throwing in the nine. Back in the day, throwing in the 90s was hard. No, I mean, it was very rare you had a guy throwing high 90s. But anyway, Verlander was a true power pitcher. He would live 94, between about 94, 96. But when he needed it late, whoa, here came 100. But he didn't live there for nine innings. It wasn't until like the seventh or eighth when he was. Jesus, do it. man, you can't throw a no hitter unless you go nine. <laughs> right? We you guys had all these no hitters and chase these no hitters. What about the seven inning no hitter? Well, that's a what's with the double header though, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's but I mean it's just that's the it's crazy. And and the, and 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 put put it this way, front office's answers for why these guys are getting hurt and how to fix it was have them go less. And guess what? That hasn't worked. We've, we've required, we've, we've chased the velocity. We've chased the spin front office. These G if these guys are so freaking smart, why is everybody still getting hurt? Cause what they, th- their answer was use them less, use them less. So all the fancy degrees and all the data guys, here's what we'll do. We'll use them less. That hasn't worked. They're getting hurt more. So what's your answer, fancy smart guys? That's how I should start the uh, the interview with uh, with Force on Friday. All the degrees, uh, all your Ivy League fancy degrees. Well, you don't have medical degrees, but all your fancy data analysis degrees, MIT, Caltech, all you guys keep coming in. You can't keep these pitchers healthy. And your answer was to sh- throw them less. Well, you've hurt yourself by throwing them less, and they still get hurt. Now what? I think that is, but to me, that would be a joke. I'll play all the fancy degrees. I'll say that, and I'm going to ask him. The answer was to throw them less, and now that hasn't worked. Now what? And I know he's going to, I mean, Dave's David's always honest. I know Dave's going to say they don't know. They really don't know. And that's tough for smart. Trust me. 
when you're dealing with people who think they're really, really, really smart, it's tough for them to say, I don't know. Smart people hate telling you that. And I can say that because I don't consider myself one of those smart people. Now, I think I'm creative and all those kinds of things. But these people, I don't have a fancy degree. I'm, a, I'm just a public educated kid. These people go to these fancy schools and their parents paid a lot of money or they took on a lot of school debt. They they think they're the smart cream of the crop. And they may be, books-wise. But you start getting into sports-wise, these guys are all so smart. Why can't they keep these guys healthy? If these guys are so smart, why do their teams lose? Oh, nice play on the, uh, this guy's that's a good hitter. Why doesn't he hit? Right? Half the teams, I mean, do you want me... I mean, I'll go the standings right now. Go get me the resumes of everybody who works for pick a team. How many? Go get me the resumes of everybody who works for the Rockies. You think they got some Ivy League guys on that staff? Probably. I don't think their GM is one, but they probably have guys and guys or gals in the front office. All right, that just are. checking. Where else you want to go? How about the Astros? Remember, they were so smart. Well, they're not smart anymore. Might be Dana Brown's on a. I don't know where Dana Brown went to college, but what about the Blue Jays? Ross Atkins is a. What about all? I mean, because they have all these data guys. They got yeah. all these yes. guys that are in the organization. They're not that smart anymore. Are the Nationals guys not that smart anymore. Mike Rizzo. But what about all the guys he's hired? They all have those fancy degrees. Where are they? At the end of the year, more than half the teams will be under five hundred. Those guys aren't smart anymore. So if we're going to applaud the guys who are smart when they win, what do we say when they lose? Because God knows they can't keep their pitchers healthy. And they were supposed to be able to keep, they were supposed to keep, and they've had visions of how to keep these guys healthy, right? We're not going to throw them at all in the minor leagues. Paul Skeens, get this. The guy who's the number one pick at LSU who's thrown a ton in LSU and college. He's an experienced pitcher, ready to pitch in Major League Baseball. They'd say... He's got a lot of boxes to check. Still got some boxes to check down in the minor leagues when he clearly has no boxes to check. They send him down his first two starts. This is a guy that's pitched at the highest level in college, ready to rock, dominate spring training. Uh, first two starts as a Pittsburgh farhand, he throws how much? Six innings. Three in each. At LSU, when did he go three innings? Uh, probably never. Ah. Uh. I mean, he probably went longer than three. So their idea has been pitch the guys less, but guys get hurt more. How's that work? Fascinating to hear what David has to say on Friday. Fascinating. Yeah. Anybody who thinks they know what's going on, I I, I want to hear because the, the, the numbers from the youth level to the pro level, crazy. All righty, it's time for the Mark Kotze Show, brought to you by Nest Betting. Love where you sleep. Nest Betting, proud sponsors of the A's. If you need a bed, you need a mattress, Ricky Henderson sleeps on a nest bed, go to nestbedding.com. Here is Mark Kotze. The Mark Kotze Show brought to you by nestbedding.com. Love where you sleep. For all your bedding needs, we're talking about your bed, mattress, pillow, sheets, you need, you name it, you go to nestbedding.com. Kotz, it sounds like it's a little cold there in Detroit. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. It's it is different. Uh, you know, I mean, the bay is cold, but this is uh, this is colder for sure. What is that like for teams? And I know you've had to do it throughout your career. As you get used to being in Arizona, people are in shorts, people are playing golf, life's good. And now all of a sudden, you're in the East Coast, you're in the Upper Midwest, you're not in a dome, and it's really cold. Watching all the highlights, it's cold all over the place. What is that adjustment like? Yeah, I mean, it's an adjustment, you know, but uh, thank God for heaters in the dugout. Um, you know, you can tell guys get on deck and, uh, you know, they, they basically put their bats on the heater, get the pine tar kind of sticky again. Um, there's an adjustment to it. But, uh, you know, I mean, everyone's dealing with the same thing. Uh, it's not like, you know, like you said, the whole league, uh, mm -hmm. the whole East Coast, Midwest right now, the weather is cold and, um, you know, it's not – atypical for baseball but uh uh you know we still have to grind we still have to play through it 
you know, you get out to a start like this. How, how tough is it for your ball club? Because obviously, I mean, Captain Obvious, everybody wants to start hot. And unfortunately, you guys haven't been able to do it. Yeah, you know, um, it's difficult. Uh, obviously, you know, we're we're at this point here, um, you know, one and seven now or that, uh, you know, you feel that there's no question. Um, you know, we've wanted to get off to a good start. Uh, we, we knew it was going to be important to get off to a good start, but, uh, we've put ourselves, you know, in the situation we were last year where, uh, you know, we're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit from a wins loss standpoint. I think the last three games, uh, we've definitely, you know, been competitive. We've could have won all three of these last games. Um, and, and in saying that, um, you know, you do, you do look at that to build some type of momentum and confidence, but, you know, losing sucks. Uh, there's no other way to say it. And uh, we've dealt with it for uh, a period of time now that, uh, you know, you, you get tired of it. And uh, I know this group's tired of it. There's a level of expectation amongst this group that we left spring training with, that we can compete, that we can win. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're at a point where we just we got to go win games and figure out how to win games. Um, and that's, you know, where I sit this morning. Um, from from the standpoint of, uh, I think once we break through and and we start winning games, there's going to be a momentum shift um, that that uh, that really helps us with the success rate. Is it hard not to press right out of the gate when you're when you're a team and you got a bunch of players trying to prove themselves? Like you're trying to do it all in one at bat, all in one inning, and that's a tough way to play. Yeah, and 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 each guy in itself is taking on shouldering some level of responsibility and some level of uh, expectation, right? Because they want to be the guy, and if their teammates are failing, they want to step up. And um, I think really the the need for a deep breath, the need to just take the at bat um, to try to get you know your teammate up behind you. We've talked about that. Um, you know, yesterday was a good sign of being down. Uh, in a game coming back and uh, and battling back against, you know, one of the better pitchers in the game, giving ourselves a chance to win. Um, you know, there's a different feeling from last year in those type of games that, that we have a, a lineup that can can come back from a deficit. And we have a pitching staff and bullpen that can can hold us uh, in games to give us that opportunity. So, um, you know, the the group itself um, you know, as I talked about, we, we felt like we could get out to a good start. We haven't. Um, so I think there is a level of, of, uh, a weight on the shoulders of these guys that we're going to try to do our best to, to, you know, eliminate and to help with. But, uh, at the end of the day, the, the, we all know winning, winning takes care of those type of, uh, uh, expectations and emotions. Well, when this airs, we're going to have a couple games on this road trip. But just looking at Friday's game where you had a couple guys hit the ball out, you break that scoreless streak. When you talk about getting back on track, can you look at that game to say some positives came for you offensively? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, even even with Geloff, I know, uh, you know, he hasn't swung the bat the way that he's capable of. Um, but, you know, he hit a double yesterday. Um you know, that that's going to lead to some momentum, some confidence building. I think Rooker hitting the ball over the, you know, over the fence. Um, also barreling a couple balls hitting, you know, uh, you know Toro with his homer. So, um, you know, there is momentum offensively that can be, can be taken from Friday. And, uh, you know, as we tape this Saturday morning, I hope that uh, we can continue to build off of that from yesterday. There are some positives. And I think one, no, no question, Paul Blackburn, what have you seen so far? Yeah, Paul's first outing was great. Um, seven innings. I mean, he he grinded. Um, you know, that's that's vintage Paul. He he has that capability of of going out and and pitching deep into games, getting early contact, uh, weak contact, and uh, you know, tonight today's the same kind of you know situation where he's the guy that wants to go out and step up and and provide that same. Uh, <coughs> same outing that he did and give us a, a great chance to win a game. Yeah. It's so interesting how, if you can get the starting staff going, it, they can feed off of each other. And next thing you know, they start to get into a rhythm and that could be big for your ball club. Yeah, no question. You know, we've had, you know, 
multiple outings now from our starters. Um, JP yesterday, you know, I mean, he he grinded through just about six innings, um, you know, got touched up um, a, a little bit in in only one of those innings where, um, you know, he rebounded. He had three solid innings to start the game. The fourth was a little shaky. Uh, and then one mistake in the sixth to Canna that, uh, you know, eventually led to him being taken out. But um, overall, he kept us in a game, you know, four runs over the course of five and two thirds. Um, you know, that that's that's quality. And, and uh, again, you know, Paul goes out today and, and you know, hopefully he's the guy that stops this uh, this, you know, four game losing streak. How do you view the uh, your, your bullpen so far? You know, I think we, the bullpen's been a little bit taxed. Um, those, those first few outings on the starters didn't really cover a ton of uh, innings, uh, but I think we've got them reset. And, uh, you know, I think Lucas Sersig's had just, you know, a little bit of bad luck, uh, made made one or two bad pitches in, in leverage situations. Um, you know, overall, uh, I think, you know, Austin Adams has been a great addition. He's done a nice job. Uh, TJ McFarland's done a nice job. Two veteran guys we picked up right there before we set rosters um, that have that have fit in really nicely and are helping these guys. And Mason Miller, you know, we saw what he's capable of uh, against Boston with those two innings. Yeah, I can't wait to get Mason Miller in a game you're leading because the stuff is is just absolutely electric. And, and I got to think as a manager, it's tough early not to tax your bullpen. You want to try and win every single game. You're obviously probably not going to get as long of outings as you want out of your starters. So how much do you have to be cognizant of that as you want to win? But man, I just can't burn my best guys out early. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, definitely a, a situation that you were, we're aware of. Um, you know, you don't want to just continually use the bullpen um, this early and like you said, wear them out. But um, you know, I think we've done a nice job of, of kind of managing that process over the first eight games, you know, giving guys opportunities to get in big situations, um, utilizing, you know, a, a Kyle Muller and a, and a, uh, and a Spence to, to, you know, cover some innings down there. And they've done a great job. Kyle's done a nice job covering innings. Uh, and so is Spence. Yeah, Kyle Muller. I mean, he has looked fantastic. He's looked like the guy we – this is the guy we always thought he could be, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and we made – some big changes. He made some big changes uh, this off season. His arm angle uh, was a lot lower last last season, and uh, we've got you know he went in himself and decided that he needed to get back to where he was. He raised his arm angle, I think, almost six to eight inches, which is pretty drastic for a pitcher. And uh, we've seen some success. You know, when you start looking at the competition, because after this you're going to go to Texas. Obviously, they're the defending champs. Boston out to a really good start. Stephen Vogt in, Cle in Cleveland off to a really good start. You know, I know I know you're not happy about the record, but how can your team really grow playing this good, stiff competition early? Yeah, I mean, we, we've definitely faced some good teams um, and uh, we're going to continue to face good teams. I, and, you know, when you say grow, it's it's a matter of us, like I said, gaining confidence when we win some games against these type of teams, you know, and, and everyone can argue like, you know, one run games, uh, the better teams win one run games. Well, the, actually, one run games are decided by one play here, one play there, one pitch. Um, and and so we've been right there with these teams. We're competitive over the last three. And uh, and I think that, like, again, I think that's going to help lead to just more more wins this this season. You know, we have talked about it before on this show, your love for Oakland. I know one of your kids was born in Oakland. You love being an Oakland A. You love being the manager of the A's. We've talked about that before, but obviously the move this past week, talking about playing in Sacramento the next three years after this, you've addressed it already. But I just want to know, have you talked to the team about it? What's it like for the team is it something they think about or is it or they these guys just battling for jobs and they're about they're about the here and the now and, and trying to establish careers? Yeah, you know, we didn't have a team meeting about it. Um, I, I know, you know, obviously we've known this was the possibility for a long time. Um, the guys in that room, uh, you know, they're more concerned about this season right now. And and, you know, obviously where we're at eight games into, into the year. Um, 
you know, I think that, uh, as you talk about for me, I, both of my daughters were born, born, uh, you know, while I was in Oakland athletic and, and, uh, you know, like I said yesterday, it's, it's definitely emotional, but, um, you know, the focus right now for me as the manager of the Oakland athletics is, is to, you know, get this team winning games, get this team prepared, uh, day in, day out to, to go out and, and, and have success. And, you know, that's going to be in Oakland this year. And, you know, at the end of this season, you wrap your mind around what Sacramento, um, you know, is, is, is going to offer. Um, but until then, really my focus, which has been from the start is, is to win baseball games in Oakland. And, um, you know, it's frustrating that, that over the course of my tenure so far that hasn't taken place. Um, but it's, again, um, not for a lack of effort and not, not for, uh, you know, any other reason outside of just, we need, we need to get better and, and we need to improve, um, the, you know, the things that we weren't successful at last year. Um, and I know it's a limited sample size, but I do feel like, um, we have a group in this room, you know, to be competitive night in, night out and, and, uh, and win, um, and be successful. Well, let's end on this positive note. You look slick in those bomber jackets. How, how does it feel in the dugout? Because we're seeing that on uh, NBC. Like, Cots is looking good. Those things are sharp. It, it, it feels a little old school. It really does. Yeah. It feels a little bit retro. Um, they are sharp, and uh, they're warm. That's the biggest thing. They're warm. <laughs> you know, I know a lot of my staff yesterday had, you know, the masks on and the gloves. And I was looking at my bench coach yesterday for a review on the replay and he's not the loudest talker darren bush is not the loudest talker right so you yeah. kind of have to read lips well he had the mask up over his nose i said i can't read your lips darren i can't hear you and i can't read your lips so i guess we're not challenging you know um <laughs> but uh yeah i mean the bombers are nice um outside of that i'm trying my best just to stay in shape and keep up with these young guys Oh, man, snow. God, this time of the year, it's always tough. But uh, we appreciate the time. You stay warm. Good luck the rest of the series. Good luck in Texas. And we'll see you back in Oakland. All right. Thanks, Tony. That was early Saturday morning. Early. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's on East Coast time, and we're like, we got to get up out early. But ever since we got up early on Saturday morning, A's are undefeated. That's also true, yes. A's are undefeated. All right, coming up next, A's and Rangers from Arlington stacking up against the world champs. We got the game next, and, of course, we'll talk to you. Uh, we'll talk to you after the game. Take yeah. some phone calls, and I'll see you tomorrow. Yep, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Yep. A's and Rangers next right here on A's Cast and the A's Radio Network. Where does one community end and the next begin? Across the railroad tracks? On the other side of the river? Is it between the east side and the west side? At Comerica Bank, we believe it's all one community, and we're all part of it. That's why Comerica has invested over $20 million for affordable housing, financial education, and workforce development in lower-income communities. Because when we raise expectations for everyone, we all rise. Member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. This is the place where you can dance like nobody's watching. Win like nobody's business and get away like you mean. So what are you waiting for? Come join the party. Take that evening out and make it a night you'll never forget. This kind of action can't be beat. Whether it's a midweek trip to the ballpark to catch a game or a weekend of baseball for the family, Grab your tickets for an A's game this season. Secure your seats today for all the biggest matchups, fireworks, drone shows, giveaways, and more. Don't miss out on all the things happening this season. Throws and set. It's a drive into center. It's deep and straws back at the track. He will turn and watch it fly. 
So grab yours now at athletics.com slash tickets. That's athletics.com slash tickets. The A's YouTube page is your go-to destination for A's video content. Get access to great highlights, exclusive behind-the-scenes content, classic games, A's cast live, and more. Visit youtube.com slash athletics. This has been a presentation of the Oakland Athletics.